E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. Happy Monday, everybody. Appreciate you hanging out with us. Hope you're doing well out there, friends. Tone's got the uh, the fresh dew uh, going there, and we know he smells good. <laughs> <laughs> the fresh dew or lack thereof. I, 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 I like it, man. I like, I like to it. say, you know, I had to uh, get it nice and clean. You know what I mean? Uh, feels good. I smell good. I took my vitamins. I ate a little ate a little breakfast, some eggs, and some broccoli, man. I feel great, man. Ready to roll, baby. Ready I, I feel to great, man. roll. All right, let, let's do a little roll. Speaking of roll, let's do a little roll call. Teresa, what is up, Twiz? What is up, David? Bry Guy, Flexit and Stepping, Stepping Nafiz. What is up, Kyle? What's up, James? What's up, Mo? Who else do we have here? Rob from Temple. Do, 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 M. Reyes, uh, Blue Torian, and I think I got everybody. So hope everybody's doing good out you there. Know what's Appreciate funny, you guys. I love how yes, you sir. really Ziggy. take the time out every show to acknowledge the people. At the beginning of every show, you take the time out. And yeah. that means a lot to me because over the weekend, I was thinking, and you know, yeah, we have our good days. We have our not as good days. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, these people come in and check in with us every single day, Monday through Friday. That's pretty, that's pretty stellar. So we appreciate yep. you guys for always taking that time out. You know, the great takes, the not so great takes, uh, you know, the support, um, the pseudo hate. We love all you guys. And um, <laughs> it's fun. It's exciting. And I'm glad you guys are a part of this journey with us. So I'm um, yep. happy Monday, man. It's February 5th, man. The month of love and the month of black history, baby. Hey, go. So let's have some fun. All right. So a couple, a couple things. Um, speaking of, did, did you, speaking of the weekend, did you watch the Grammys last night? No, <laughs> no. And actually, I'm so glad you brought that up okay. because, it, because, because I watched, but I did watch though. I watched that documentary you told me about. Yes. I watched the, the greatest night in pop. Yeah. Which and, is the, we are the world song coming, yes. all coming. And together. that was what, 1984? Was that? Was 84, 84 into 85. It, it, they, right. they, they came, Harry Belafonte reached out with the idea late 84 right. and then it carried over into 85. Yes. Right. Right. And it was, um, the AMAs and Correct. one thing, and one thing that stood out to me and me and the wife were talking about it. One person said, you know, the AMAs, that was the, you know, at that time, that was the biggest night in music. You know, yeah. that was a really, that was a big freaking deal. So, you know, when you bring up the Grammys, it's just like award shows, they've lost their significance, you know, um, superstars, musicians, they've kind of lost that mystique. You know what I mean? Because of the access we have now. But right. Uh no, I didn't watch the Grammys, man. Um, I just can't really get into war shows anymore. The, it used to be an event where the family would literally we order food or we'll watch the we'll watch the performances, we'll talk about it the next day at maybe in high school or middle school. And right. it, it used to be an event, man. I remember I used I my family used to gather around the TV and watch the BET Awards because it was always something you was sure. leaving there with. Always sure. something. Yeah. But now, you know, it, you know, they just don't have the they don't have the same magic anymore. Yeah, I got you, man. I, I, I was, my wife was watching it and I was, what was I watching? I was watching, I don't know, Villanova blew out Providence last night. I was flipping around a little bit. So oh, she was God. watching. I put it, I saw a little bit. Uh, I didn't see a ton, but I'm, I'm glad you got a chance to check out. Um, all right, let's see what, hey, Rob, who is more of a priority, Swift or Reddick? I believe Reddick deserves his contract, even though Swift is, oh, he's going Taylor Swift since we were talking Grammys. Um, <laughs> I'd say Taylor is. No, I would say a more of a priority would be Reddick. Uh, but if you don't re-sign Swift, you better figure it out real quick what you're doing at running back, whether that's the draft or however you're going to handle this thing. So, uh, but but appreciate you, you, you the question there. Um, no, real quick. Oh, I see, I see that Slagger57, true detective. I know I'm all over the place. I don't care. Um, I'm not, I've watched, my wife and I watched the first, two episodes friday so i didn't see i think last night was the fourth i heard that show was really good um i haven't I'm not, um i'm not loving it so far it's a, okay see it's an anthology so you know I, every season is like a different set of detectives oh it's totally different i love right, right, right. i've never I, i've never got into it at all so i, I i've okay. been thinking about starting from the very beginning oh okay okay hold on this time full full time out uh -oh. you have to watch the first season that's the one with Matthew mcconaughey right McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. It is spectacular. It's some of the best acting you will ever see from McConaughey. Mm. Okay, that so 100% watch the first year. Got you. 
I'm trying not to get into this one. I, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it for anybody. So, you know, watch if you want, I'm not whatever. And I'm going to watch the third one and it might, it might hook me in a little bit more. I didn't, I didn't love, I didn't hate it. I didn't right. love the first two. I like Jody Foster, but I didn't love the first two so far. It's okay. It's okay. It might get you, it might get you in the third episode. You never know. It might, it might, it might yeah, yeah. You, you know, it might I'm be not done with it. I'm watching it. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, okay. I'm, cool, I'm going to watch cool. the third one. Yeah, for sure. All hey, right, did so, you notice uh, <laughs> the person in the chat? <laughs> Don't to shields. I Completely. Just, <laughs> that's how you know you've made it, Rob. When, when they create a, when they create a YouTube account with, you know, with your photo and they I, play around I, with your I, name. I agree with you. I listen. I love this. Actually. I appreciate whoever this is. You are appreciated. Trust and believe. That's how you know you made it. I made it. You guys. That's I it. have. Congrats, I have, uh, I have parody accounts now, Rob. That's it, man. You're big time. You are big time. You know what they say, man. You know, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. For sure, man. I love you guys, truly. Um, all right. So anyway, yeah, but I'm glad you you, you caught up on that, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the 84, 85, uh, you know, We Are the World. It was spectacular. Yeah, it was. Um, and yeah, it, and again, a little bit of the Grammys, not a ton. Uh, watched a little bit of uh, you know, True Detective over the weekend. So we'll yeah. uh, again, we always try to pass along little nuggets for you. If there's yeah. something we we watch, we'll, we'll pass it along to you. This One thing I will say, Rob. Yeah, my man Killer Mike had a great night at the Grammys. He had quite a he had quite a night. Yes, my he man did. Killer Mike, baby, got a win and got got uh got some some handcuffs sla slapped. Got some bracelets slapped on him real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You know what they say, man. And any kind of pub is good pub. So Killer Mike, sure, got some man. Good pub last I, I love Killer Mike, man. Um, truly, um, one of the, in my opinion, one of the one of the most underrated rappers out there, man. Been been doing it for a long time, and um, I loved him and Run the Jewels. I love his I, lo I love his most recent project, Michael, from beginning to end. He's uh. He's just a hell. He's a hell of an artist, man, and just a hell of a uh, an orator, speaker, a hell of an intellect. Um, truly, truly, a man of um, a man of character that wears multiple hats. So, yeah, shout out to Killer Mike, man. I didn't watch the Grammys, but one thing I did know, my man Killer Mike uh, won Best Rap Album of the Year, Best Hip Hop Album of the Year, and, and I'm rolling with that. That's right. That's right. And you you're gonna bail him out later. He he didn't you didn't hear that part of it. He asked you for for a little bail money, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So a couple other things here, uh, Joel Embiid. So here's what we know. Uh, he will have a corrective procedure, um, AKA some form of surgery, uh, to correct a meniscus injury, which is specifically known as displaced flap of meniscus. Who knew that was a thing? Uh, but that is a thing. So he's going to have surgery. Now it, it could be in the six to eight week range, which would get him back, you know, essentially like mid March ish, but you ne until you get in there and look around and see what's going on, you know, in the knee, we don't know. And we're not going to know. So until he has the surgery, we really won't know in a way tone. I'm glad in this sense with the, the rest thing, it, it was going to be basically him just, you felt like dragging a knee around in the postseason again. Right. And for at least this time, they're doing exactly what they have to do to get this guy back to being as close to 100% as he can be. And I know with his injury history, it, you know, who knows what, what that even means. But this, I think, is the is the right choice for him and the team. Yeah, yeah. I would have to agree. Um, Look, you know, you and I talked about this uh, offline. This is – one of the more frustrating things about Joel Embiid's arc, you know, big, you know, chron chronicling his, uh, you know, his journey throughout the NFL, you see a guy who's ultra talented, clearly the most dominant player in basketball, but his body continues to fail him. It kind of gives me Derrick Rose vibes, a yeah. guy who's supremely talented. Obviously, Derrick Rose's injuries hampered him way more, but Derrick Rose, Joel Embiid, two guys who are at the pinnacle, guys who coming off MVPs. And they just cannot stay healthy no matter what they do or try, man. And I'm sure those guys, I'm sure Joel Embiid's doing everything possible physically, mentally, to try to make sure he stays healthy. He's, I know he's taking, he's, he started taking his conditioning ways more serious over the past three or four years or so. And it's just all that size, all that athleticism, all that skill. Mm -hmm. His frame, his frame can't hold the power. Yep. His frame, his, his vessel cannot hold that much dominance and that's and that's basically how i look at it i agree i agree it's just everybody's body's different and 
that's a that's a gigantic human being and for whatever reason the the lower extremities his lower extremities just can't ha- hold up i had somebody ask me yesterday on the on the on wip they said to me, well how come how come joker's not hurt i said everybody's body's different you know everybody responds differently mm-hmm. it, you know it, it it's not it's not a knock at you well it doesn't mean yeah. he's soft it doesn't mean anything like yeah. that if you notice Jokic, they play the game totally differently Jokic is more flat-footed. He doesn't True. really leave the ground that much. He's very contained, but yes. it's like controlled chaos. Like he yep. doesn't, he doesn't do too much with his body physically, but his footwork is tremendous. He can create so much space with so much with, with so little movement. Um, You're Jordan right. Bean, it's probably Jordan less Bean. wear and tear on his on his Ex- legs. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah, um, no question. All right, hopefully, well, hopefully, there's a silver lining at the end of this thing. So we're going to talk. Keith Pompey is going to join us at 12. We'll get into detail with Embiid, what they do at the trade deadline, which is Thursday. Uh, you know, it's clearly been a struggle of late. And, and you know, the differences this season without Embiid compared to other seasons. So we will we will talk all those things with Keith coming up at 12 o'clock. The Eagles have themselves a quarterback's coach, Tone. Yes, Doug Neusmeyer do. uh, comes over here. He has worked the last six years with Kellen Moore both in Dallas and with the Chargers last season. So these two know each other very well. Um, you know, he's a respected guy. He, um, look, those two are tasked along with Nick with the most important job of this team, making sure you get Jalen Hurts back to elite. Absolutely. Plain and, Absolutely. Simple. And, I, and I'm not going to pretend to sit here and pretend to tell you that I watched the Pro Bowl uh, competition skills. I did not. Um, but I saw some highlights of Jalen Hurts moving around and he looked pretty good to me. I understand that that's not real football. There aren't guys chasing him. He isn't getting tackled, but maybe Mm -hmm. what what I'm I'm driving at here is maybe all the knee needed was a little bit of rest for a couple of weeks. And hopefully there, there isn't a procedure that's needed, um, which bodes well for next year. So that's good. But, you know, let's look at it tone because, you know, in some ways, his numbers are still very impressive last season, mm-hmm. but in other ways, they weren't. Um, all right, so 2022, it, mind you, he did this in 15 games, right? So uh, 3,701 passing yards, 22 touchdowns, six interceptions. This past year, played all 17, 3,858 yards, 23 touchdowns, 15 interceptions. So the, mm-hmm. the obvious big difference there is the interceptions, nine more uh, this year. A completion percentage very similar, 66.5 and 22 to 65.4 last year. Passer rating's a big drop off. Correct. Uh, 101.5 in 2022, 89.1 last year. And, and that's due to those turnovers, man. Right on. Uh, rushing, you know, he ran for a little bit more. And I don't think that's a huge deal, but he did run for more 760 in 2022 compared to 605 last year. Uh, rushing yeah. touchdowns similar, thirteen to fifteen, and but here's the other, you know, big distinction: zero fumbles in twenty two. Well, fumbles lost. Lost. That's the big thing. Fumbles lost. And this is because he's I'm fumbled the same amount five yeah. times last year, six times this year. Some of it. Sometimes, luck. and this just goes to tell you, the ball bounced the Eagles' way a lot last year. It, it sure did. It sure and this did. year, not so much. So he ended up with four that he lost le- this past year. So all right, so right. so let's let's dig into this thing a little bit, just just to sort of gauge this and how much of a turnaround, you know, in fact, this is going to be for him and what we think it's going to be. Um, w- w- would you categorize this as like an overhaul or just sort of a tune-up when it comes to him in, in car parlance? I don't think I, I don't think um, I don't think Jalen Hurts needs an overhaul. You know, I don't think he needs a new transmission or a new engine. You know what I mean? I think I think Jalen Hurts, like you said, I think he needs a tune up. I think he needs a uh, oil a oil change, a tire rotation. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, probably needs to uh, you know uh, you know get some new tires in general. But I br- I look at a guy like Doug N- N- uh, Newsmeyer. Am I pronouncing that right? Uh, Newsmeyer. 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 Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I- I'm looking at his experience, right? And I was talking to John McMullen about this yesterday. Him and I did a um, a, a quick football 24 seven in lieu of the hires, and obviously they let go DK McDonald. We're going to talk about that, I'm sure. But I look at a guy like Doug Newsmeyer's experience. He played in the league, um, was very successful in college, but he's been a quarterback coach for north of 20 years. He's been coaching quarterbacks since 2001. The BC yeah, he's Lions 53. quarterback. It's just not a young cat, you know. He's right. not just starting out. Yeah. 
Right. And he he has some pretty strong credentials, right? He was um a Fresno the Fresno State off OC and quarterback coach, St. Louis Rams quarterbacks coach in 0607. Um, the Washington offensive coordinator and co- quarterbacks coach. I think this is the college team. Um, from 2012 to 2013, Alabama's offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, Michigan OC and QB coach, Florida OC and QB coach, and he made and he made his way back to the NFL. Um, the dude has real experience. Um, he's been brought in by some of the most top tier programs in football, so he has to have some level of success at his job. Mm-hmm. Um, the Philadelphia Eagles are doing everything possible to leverage experience um, against Jalen Hurts' skill set, and they're not leaving any stone unturned. Now we can obviously go back and discuss and you know rip them apart about their previous decisions, but I kind of want to focus on today and going forward. And as of right now, uh, Doug Newsmeyer, based off of his based off his experience and um, the type of programs that he attacked that he's been attached to. Um, he has to be good at his job in some shape, way, or form. So I'm curious to see what he can bring out of a guy like Jalen Hurts. I think, you know, the first thing you do is, you know, uh, you sit down with him and you get his opinion of what, how he views last year. And I don't think you color it either way. Like you say to him, all right, give me, just give me your thoughts on last season. Mm-hmm. And I want to hear what he has to say, you know, what, what he has to say on a positive level, what he has to say, okay, all right. So here's what I'm saying. If you're, if, you know, if I'm Kellen Moore and I'm Nussmeyer, who having, you know, which is nice to have a, a fresh set of eyes coming in to look at this. Absolutely. All right. Here's what I'm saying. I thought this worked well. Uh, I thought this didn't work well. I'm looking to get away from this. You know, these are the things that we, meaning these are the things that the coaching staff can correct on our end. Here's what I'm seeing for you, from you, uh, you know, footwork, whatever, whatever, you know, this is what we need to do. We think for you to have more success in the pocket, climbing the pocket or, or whatever. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to emphasize everything has to be a big chunk play. I want us to be able to take what's given to us and, and just, you know, matriculate the ball down the field, et cetera, whatever, whatever this, whatever the, the, the concepts are that they have. I think the other thing the Eagles think is Kellen Moore and, and Neusmeyer are going to blend what they do well with what the Eagles feel like they already do well and try to get the best of both worlds. Because he said, for the most part, Moore's had guys who were more pocket. Dak's more of a pocket. Herbert's more of a pocket. Mm-hmm. So there, but that's okay. I mean, you any good coach can adapt, or should at least in theory be able to adapt to what he has. It doesn't mean you take away Jalen's, you know, strengths there. Right. I think, in fact, you know, they you they ran a lot of uh, RPO stuff with Herbert last year. I think that'll continue. I think we'll see more of it, and hopefully, we get back to letting Jalen run the ball a little bit more. And I know a lot of people don't don't agree with that, but I want to play to the guy's strengths. I don't care. Yeah, and here's here's another thing too. Look, you know, I, I look I look at Jalen Hurts as a guy, right? Oh yeah, he's a dual threat guy. Yeah, but let's you know let's not pretend like he can't. Not you, but let's not pretend he can't throw the ball at yeah. all. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like 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 Jalen Hurts is a guy who can throw the ball. That's not that's not hearsay. That's not a myth. He's he can be he can be very accurate. As a matter of fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, I want to make sure I got this right. Um, I'm looking at a, I'm looking at an old tweet from my guy Jeff Kerr um, on October 30th, 2023, and from that date, you know he has a stat here saying since the start of last season, from that date, um, Jalen Hurts is, uh, has a 72.7 completion percentage, um, uh, over over 5,300 uh, uh, passing yards, 31 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. 8.6 yards per attempt, a 107.1 um, passer rating um, uh, in the pocket, which is first in the NFL at that time, second in passer rating at that time, third in yards per attempt at that time, and seventh in TD passes at that time. So Jalen Hurts, he knows how to throw the ball from the pocket. Right. What I would like to see more is him utilize the entire field from the pocket. I would like I would like his pocket presence to improve. Um, I definitely think he took a step back with the footwork. We talked about that. Yeah. But um. I don't, I'm not looking at Jalen Hurts as a project. You know what I mean? I'm not looking at that at all, but I'm definitely looking at Jalen Hurts as a guy who can definitely stand to um, increase his repertoire and expand his game. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a lot of pressure on Jalen Hurts coming into the season because they're surrounding him with a lot of quality people. Now, will it work? Will it, you know, will the marriage work? We have no idea. Will they be a great fit? We ultimately have no idea. We're basing it off their experience. But when they're surrounding you with guys that have quality um, stops you know, on their resume, and who've 
been doing their job at a high level for north of 20 years, like a like a Doug Newsmeyer and Kellen Morrow, who's been in OC for five or six straight seasons and has proven track record in, in beating the Blitz. There's a lot of pressure on Jalen Hurts coming into the season. You're the franchise quarterback. That contract kicks in this year. I'm done talking about the project and, you know, how he's still developing. Listen, yes, his career is always going to be fluid. He's always going to be learning more and more and more. But now you're getting paid the big bucks, playboy. And um, I'm one of your biggest fans. So uh, a lot of pressure on you coming into the season. Um, it's time to it's time to put up or shut up, in my humble opinion. I like a couple things. I like that you have a fresh set of eyes on them that come in from the outside and look at the film and weren't in the middle of it last year. I think there's an right. advantage to that, right? Like they're like they're not biased. They're not. No. It's, it's, they're they're looking at it with fresh eyes. Like you, I love I love the way you put that. Fresh. Yeah, eyes. you're going to be clean. Like all right, this worked. This didn't work. I, I don't know why. I don't care why. But let let's let's get to where we need to get to. I think mm -hmm. that's important. I also like the fact that now this is. The, Nick has two guys that he can kind of lean on who have seen more stuff than the other two guys who were here last year, you know, especially Fangio. But I mean, I think the same thing with Kellen Moore. So I, I, I like those two. I think there are two advantages that you have now that you didn't necessarily have last season. And I think we, when it comes to Jalen, I, I truly do believe this. I mean this. I think he is a guy. A lot of times when you have the accomplishments at the professional level that, that Jalen's had and you got paid like Jalen did, Sometimes guys start to just uh, check out, do the Wentz thing or, or whatever. I don't think that that's Jalen Hurts. I think he is open to coaching. I think he's open to being coached up. His whole career, his whole life, it was his dad, who we know was, wasn't was playing, Nick Saban, who doesn't play, and Lincoln Riley, who doesn't play when it comes to mm -hmm. the offense. So he's used to it. So coach him up, man, and get into him. And I think it's the best way to get the best out of him. And the other thing I'm doing, Tone, I'm showing him 22. Hey, look at the way you climb the pocket here and deliver this football. Let's let's get back to that. Another let's thing, too, Rob. Yeah. You know, I look at Jalen Hurts as a guy, right? Look, you have there, 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 there's there's a there's a large opportunity in front of Jalen Hurts, right? And this, and I look at him as a guy who never really was given anything when you really think about it. You know, his journey. When you think about it from Alabama, then the Oklahoma and how everything went, and the, even his, for his his beginnings in the NFL, things were never, ever exactly how he wanted them to be, I'm sure. Um, he, there were doubts about him all along the way. He's had to earn it every step of the way. He's had to prove people wrong every step of the way. So with that, with, with, you know, with, with, with that track record, with, with that history, one can only assume that this guy has the mindset of I can never get too comfortable because it can, it can be taken away from me at a moment's notice. He's he's experienced that. So I would like to think that mindset, will, you know, would definitely translate over um, into his, um, you know, into his new path as a franchise quarterback, never getting comfortable, never being satisfied with the status quo. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and I think that that's the thing with him that he can always lean back on. Like it was never this just you know, straight up, you know, moonshot to rocket to the moon or anything, whatever the stupid cliche you want to use. It was always tough. It was always getting knocked down a couple of times, taking a step back and then, and then launching forward. So I think that's good that he can, he can, you know, depend on that kind of stuff and, and fall back on that kind of stuff. I think just from a psyche standpoint, uh, it'll be good for him. And look, the other part of it is the talent's there. In my opinion, the talent's there. You know, and, and there are things that you can do to get the most out of this guy. And this is where the coaching comes into it, you know. And, and I I think you take this job with the understanding, at least, in my opinion, you take this job with the understanding, if you're Kellen Moore, that it's priority one or none of us are going to be back next year. You think about it, Tone. If this team doesn't have success, Nick Sirianni's out of here. When the head coach is out of there, it's not often that, it, that a coordinator gets retained. Sometimes right. they do. Sometimes it happens, but not often. So odds are all these cats are looking for work next year if this doesn't work with Jalen Hurts. And, and, and odds are, see, and this is why I think this is how it may play out. And this is only if things go south with Nick Sirianni. I firmly believe if things go south with Nick Sirianni, they're going to position one of those guys that they've hired as their interim head coach. And that's going to be their way of being able to retain the staff, right? Maybe. That's going to be the, that's going to be their loophole. Because can you really see them? Shifting their entire staff three years in a row, 
And and, and also, you, you're you not just shifting your staff to these nobodies. You're bringing in some guys with pedigree, guys who've been around the league, guys that guys that have earned the respect of their peers. I don't think the Philadelphia Eagles, even if they off Nick Sirianni, are, try, are looking at it from the perspective of, we got to we got to clear this whole staff out. I think they're going to elevate either Kellen Moore, likely to be Kellen Moore because he's the younger guy, he's the offensive minded guy. That's what they lean more into. I think they're more likely to elevate him, and then you know that gives them the ability to kind of retain that staff and, and kind of lessen the amount of work they have to do going into that follow up season. And again, this is all speculative, and we every, we have no idea how this thing is going to play out. But because of the situation Nick Sirianni is in currently, we have to consider those options. Right. No doubt. Everything's on the table, man. After the way last year went, you know, everything's on the table. That's for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. All right. So let's come back and I want to dive into, we're going to put Jalen aside for a second here. Okay. Put Jalen on, on, on the side, on, on the back burner for one minute here. And I want to ask the question, what are the three biggest fixes that this team has to make aside from Jalen Hurts? Three biggest fixes this team needs to make again, 12 o'clock, Keith Pompey, one thirty. Scott Lauber is going to join us. We'll talk some Phillies as they are inching close to spring training. We'll have our NFL segment uh, coming up at one o'clock as we always do a lot in store for you on this Monday. Don't go anywhere. He's tone. I am Rob. All right. I'm going to tell you about Bravo pizza of Havertown I was in there Friday uh, and you got Alex and the crew. They're getting a brand new oven wood burning oven it is going to be a killer in there trust me when i tell you that family owned since 1985 uh, i've been going there since i was a kid bravo pizza offers 20 different styles of pizza they have slices to go i get the upside down uh but they have specialized pizza however you want it they'll make it and they don't just do pizza they do fresh pasta sandwiches wraps wings salads Across the board, they get you covered. Bravo Pizza of Havertown is also committed to the community. They have fundraisers for charities, for schools, for little leagues, where the proceeds go to those organizations. You can follow them at the Bravo Pizza of on Instagram and Facebook for daily specials and promotions. They're located at 1305 Westchester Pike Manoa Shopping Center, Havertown, PA. That's 1305 Westchester Pike Manoa Shopping Center, Havertown, Pennsylvania. Give them a call, 610-446-3810, 610-446-3810. One zero Bravo Pizza of Havertown. I remember getting my heart broken when they lost the Super Bowl in 2004. We we're big Eagles fans. We moved to South Philly because of the Eagles. When they won, we went straight to Broad Street, and uh, everybody was going nuts over there and. It was just a, a memory that you'll never forget. Any professional sports coach will tell you there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Go passionately. Go fearlessly. Go confidently. Go first! <clears throat> Go confidently towards your goals with First Trust. Philly's hometown bank for nearly 90 years and the official bank of the Philadelphia Eagles. We're focused on getting you over the goal line. So go with conviction, go with trust, go first. and go forward with us by your side. First Trust Bank, the official bank of Philadelphia dreams. 
Oh, and go birds. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game, and the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. G-L-E-S Eagles Welcome back everybody Tony to Shields Rob Ellis hanging with you on this Monday Hope you had a great great weekend Good week in, in front of you uh, That's for sure So you know Tony uh, oh, you know, Rob, Real quick Speaking of just good weeks And just good vibes right Yeah You know I'm not going to make you think too far back But let's just say Past five years All right. What do you think was the most exciting, maybe the happiest, you know, you felt in the past five years. Cool. Uh, Too far back, or should I go three years? I go five. Uh, let's okay. see. All right. So, uh, 2019. My son graduated high school in 20. Okay. It was really, really cool, but it was really difficult because it was during the pandemic. Right. I remember you telling me about that. That was a challenge. Um, my daughter graduated high school last year, which is really cool um, to see for her. So that was kind of neat. Um, I'd say those two were, were were really, really fun moments for me to watch them accomplish something in their young lives, uh, you know, with certainly more to come, hopefully. Um, but I thought that was pretty neat. How about you over the last five oh, years? Man. Last five years, one thing that comes to mind instantly uh... – Last five years, I got what are we? Yeah, I got married in twenty twenty one. So there you so, go. so 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 that was a good tremendous... answer. That better be number one. Okay, of course, of course, the wife is probably somewhere. Uh, exactly. Listen, she she, she might she if might not, be, she might somebody be, will tell her about it. If not, it, yes. it, listen, she might be on she might be on the roof right here behind oceans. You never know. Um, Correct. So yeah, uh, getting married in twenty one that was one of the happiest moments of my life for sure. Um, my mom getting her new kidney on Mother's Day. Oh that, man, that that happened uh, last year. My mom got a new kidney. She suffers from um, a form of a uh, kidney failure, but she's doing way better now. She's great. Awesome. She moves around. You know, she flew here. You know, a couple weeks ago, so she's good. Um, but yeah, that so that was number two. If I had to give you a third one, um, taking a leap of faith and moving to Texas. You know, mm-hmm. that was different. You know, I grew up in, like Philly is all I ever knew. Sure. You know what I mean? All my life. Um, and. You know, it was a change of pace and it was different. But overall, yeah. I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty um I was optimistic about it then. I'm still optim- optimistic about it now. So yeah, I think those are the three moments. Um getting married, my mom getting her new kidney, and then uh taking a leap of faith and moving to a new state. Good ones, man. I like all yeah. three. That's all strong. Yeah. Good, good. Same with you, man. You know, you're 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 a true family guy, man. And uh, you know, I, I look at you as like um I aspire to be the father that you are. Oh man, thank you. Uh, no, yeah. I look. It's hard. It's not, but it's 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 the most challenging but most rewarding job in the world. And you're gonna have days where you're like, what? What? I would say to my, why do we have kids? And yeah. then there's other days where you're like, I can't imagine my life without. So it, yeah. it's uh, it's like anything else, man. If, if it's worthwhile, you got to put the work in. Yeah, you know, definitely. not everybody scratches a lottery ticket off and wins a lottery and everything's easy. You, you know, definitely. you got you to put your work in to, to have success with it. Definitely. And live chat. I want to know about you guys, too. The past five years, what was the most happiest things you've experienced over the past five years? You know, maybe some good, maybe some bad that turned into good. But for you guys, past five years, what was the most exciting or happiest moments that you guys felt? Name as many as you want. I don't care. But I want to hear it. I want to see it. I want to see the uh, the positivity in you guys lives right now. Yeah, so I like it. it. I like it. We're getting some good, nice emoji there. <laughs> That's uh, hilarious. Left the Northeast a decade ago. Best decision. Southern, Southern living is real. Uh, Kevin can read 
relate with the uh, par <laughs> parody thing. Uh, uh, good ones. I, I like these, though. You know, moving back to North Carolina in 2019. That's okay. cool, man. That, that is very, very cool uh, for everybody. Yeah, again, you want to chime in? Uh, please feel free. Absolutely. Flexing and stepping. Oh, my God. <laughs> yep. Stimulus checks. There you go. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, I like Spa City Shop. That's cool. Sun nice. being born. Like yeah, uh, very cool. Very cool, man. Uh, very. Good stuff from everybody, Dre. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Uh, all right. So uh, one other thing I wanted to mention before we dive back into the Eagle stuff was, so Philadelphia is one of the cities to get the 2026 uh, World Cup. So there'll be six games played here at Lincoln Financial Field. Uh, the, it, they ended up giving the, the final to MetLife uh, in, in North Jersey, but here's the good news be before everybody goes into panic mode that these guys are just going to be ripping their knees up in, in MetLife. They will be replacing that crap turf with natural grass. Oh, at all. So it, so it is possible. So, so the world cup's willing to pay for that, but the, the NFL that sneezes and makes a billion dollars is not interestingly enough, but, but that is good news though, at least for the cities that have world cup games and Philadelphia, and and I and as it should, there'll be games played on July 4th in 2026, which is great. That's pretty cool. Yeah, man. That's yeah. pretty cool. I wonder, I wonder how much those tickets are going for. Um, oh geez. I I couldn't even tell you, man. I could not even tell you. Well, we got some we got some other good ones here. Um moving to the South after Super Bowl 52, best decision you made. Uh having both kids crazy. I left Philly uh to Chicago area seven years ago. Okay. Bought a house before the market went at to absolute garbage. Smart, M -R -A -M. the smart man. All right, here's the here's a huge one from Kevin. Wow, Congrats, Kevin. Wow, and Kevin, you, that's um continued help. Uh, Kevin, found the Kevin love of your life. I love that. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> happiest I was the last few years of the pandemic, not having to deal with traffic. I all right. Let me tell. I can speak to that in a second before we get to everything else. Uh, let's see. James just got married. Right, this is James. Cool. Okay, so here's here's what I will tell you. For those of us who kept working through the pandemic yes, uh, and didn't a... necessarily just work at home, it, the, the roads were eerie. Exactly. Okay. So when you work crazy hours like I do in radio and TV and all and, and all the other platforms, um, I, you know, I would I would sometimes leave to go to work either late at night, early in the morning, middle of the night, whatever, to go to, to do certain shifts. And I am not kidding you, Tone. On a 35-minute commute, not see one car on the road. Damn. And it, it feels like a weird movie where it's like an apocalypse and, and everybody, the, the, you're, you're looking around like, am I like still asleep? I haven't seen a car yet. And I'm talking about, for people who can relate to the Philadelphia area, being on major highways. It's bustling. 476, Normally. 76, the Schuylkill. Uh, Market Street, Chestnut Street, Walnut Street, and not seeing people driving, dude. Like bizarre. Very bizarre. Yeah. I, at that time, I was where I had an office job. Uh, you know, I was I was a property manager, so I had to you know constantly you know make sure I was you know I was still working through the pandemic. Um, thank God, you know. Yep. And it was and it was just it was so strange. Yeah. You know, it's like Philly is such a bustling city. City, no matter where you are, you're always gonna hear something. Yep. And to be out there those mornings and some of those evenings and moving around, it was just very eerie. Something out of something out of just like what was what was that movie where everybody kind of disappeared? Yeah, it was like the day after tomorrow and stuff like that. Just yeah, like, yeah. Or like um, you ever seen The Mist with um with Thomas Jane? No, I haven't seen that one. And and Barbara, by the way, we talk about everything. So just just so you know, you know, the large majority of what we do is sports, but we do jump around. I mean, so. we, I mean, we are humans, right? You know, yeah. we, we, we we could talk about regular stuff, you guys. It's the it's off okay. season. It's OK. Lo loosen up, Barb. Loosen yeah, up. It, we got gotcha. you. Okay. It's all right. We'll be all right. You know, we won't go up in flames. But we'll get there. Trust <laughs> me. Barb, we love you. No, but but yeah, I mean, I think it's left behind, I think, is what uh, Soul Vane left said. behind. Is that, is that what it is? Yeah. yeah, I am. Legend. I am legend. Yep. Good one. Yeah. With Will Smith. Um. Yeah, it was weird, man. It was weird. Pandemic was tough, like, um, obviously, on a million levels. But the, 2020, for me, I lost both of my parents. And not not to COVID, but I lost both of my parents that year. It was it was awful. So yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. So anyway, but but to, you know, to see the nice part of it is, like I said, my son graduated. There were some, some positives that came out of it. And all good. Yeah. All good. So uh, onward and upward, man. You keep grinding. 
Uh, sure. all, right, all right. So uh, Eagles wise, and we were, we were talking about Jalen Hurts and we got really in depth into, into what we want to see from him, what we think Kellen Moore and Doug Nussmeyer, who's the new quarterbacks coach hire can do to, to, to get him back to the level that he was in 22. So let, let's put Jalen aside for one second here. And let's go, go through the three things uh, that we, we need to see from this team. And, and here's what we'll do, Tone. We'll each take one a piece, not reel off our, our three, okay? Um, you want to go with your first? Please feel free. Or I can jump um, in, whatever you want. No, no, I, I got you. Uh, right. You know, this one isn't necessarily – and I, I didn't really rank them. I just listed three things. And this one isn't necessarily on the field. It's more so off the field, more so business-related. Yeah, I think the Philadelphia Eagles need to, need to get their books in order, especially with the cornerback room. Mm -hmm. um, those contracts between Darius Slay and James Bradbury are killing the Philadelphia Eagles right now. Um, it's not really giving them too much flexibility at that position. And I think the contract, obviously Slay is, has more money tied up in his, but you know Bradbury, when you couple that with the production, you say to yourself, I can't see myself paying that man those numbers with knowing how he, knowing how he performed. Yeah. And there's no way his representation can justify it. So um, if I'm the Philadelphia Eagles, I think they need to really take a long, hard look um, at how they're allocating resources at that position. I think they need to get younger there. Um, they, they have some young prospects. Don't get it twisted. But as far as starters go, they need to get younger and they need to get healthier. Mm -hmm. um, Darius Slay is not going to be able to play at the level he's playing at by so long. He already had a knees, um, a knee um, situation towards the end of the year. He'd been battling it all year. Avante Maddox, what are we going to do about him in the long term? Um, James Brabber, again. They got to figure out. They got to figure out how they're going to allocate resources at those positions. So I think um, they need to definitely figure out, uh, you know, to restructure, figure out a restructure. Whatever they got to do, they got to figure out that cornerback room uh, mm -hmm. almost in, almost immediately. That's a good. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. I, I would agree with that. And my number one ties into that coaching. Mm. Coaching your own head coach. Use the word stale. When it came to their play calling and their scheme, his words, not our words, his words, stale. You better figure out, and maybe you know, you answer the question with moving on for some of the coaches, but you better figure out how to not get stale again. Mm -hmm. Like you better keep that bread, you know, in, in, in the in the plastic, and you better keep the, the you know, your your little thingy on there <laughs> so it doesn't get stale real quick. Because if you get stale again, Nick, you're gonna be out of a job. So uh this needs to be fresh. It needs to be something that's innovative in some ways. It needs to be getting the best out of your players. And that goes for both sides of the ball, but especially on offense. If you don't stay ahead of the game, if you don't do what Andy Reid did, I know not everybody's Andy Reid and not everybody has Patrick Mahomes, but Andy Reid is a guy who's never afraid to be innovative and take chances and try and, you know, do things that wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily think a guy who's been around as long as Andy does. And you better look back and look at yourself in the mirror and figure out why it got so stale with you. And I right. think coaching is, a, is is enormously big for this team next year. Right, right. Just to, to just say things got stale, it's like, this is your baby. This is your product. And, 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 and you're saying, um, you know, it got stale. That's that's alarming to see. That, that's alarming to hear. Excuse yep. me. Um, yeah, uh, for me, my, my, my next one, and again, I didn't really rank these. I just listed them. Um, my next one... Uh, and it kind of goes into what you were just talking about. They need to iron out and commit to an offensive identity. For, in my humble opinion, I feel like the Philadelphia Eagles were playing tug of war with who they wanted to be all year. Did we want to pass the ball? Did we want to run the ball? You know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the organization wants one thing, but the personnel uh, is, 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 is uh, indicating another. And, you know, your team is struggling in the air. Let's lean on. It was just so much herky jerkiness about the offensive identity. Um, you know, uh, last season, and then you couple that with the turnover by the quarterback. Um, you know the uh, you know the, the questionable um route combinations. Uh, and that's what I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what Kellen Moore can bring to the table. You know, John and I talk about this a lot, and you know his perspective is. You know, it's always about the players, you know, coaching. Yeah, their job is to make you a little bit better, but the onus is always more so on the players. And I and, and I, I agree with him to a certain extent. Um, yes, the players go out there and play. And when you have talent, you're likely going to win the game. But I also say this, you know, as coaches, you have a responsibility to develop route combinations and develop an offensive identity or framework that can accentuate the talents of your personnel. 
Yep. And throughout the season, all year, we kept saying to ourselves, what are they doing out there? Why is it taking so long for these routes to develop? Is these guys are too talented to not be able to get open? Yeah. Um, and then when you swat, and then when you watch the all twenty two, and you listen to commentators that you respect, like a Greg Olson or like a Troy Aikman, you hear them talking about, you know, why are, why are the Philadelphia Eagles running these route combinations? They're, Just go they're, back, Tone, and listen to that Tampa game. Listen to what Aikman says if you if, if you have time. He, he, it's a masterclass of this is a joke what I'm seeing. I'm telling you, he takes him apart. And Aikman's not a hot taker or something. Right. Who's yeah, he's a Cowboys attention. guy, but he's he's pretty, pretty he plays it pretty. I agree. I think he's very line. fair. I yeah. do. And and he man, he kills him in that game. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. I mean, you you nailed it. It's the bottom line is it's unacceptable to have guys that talented on the field, and and under any circumstance, you you can't put route combinations that accentuate with their skill sets or help the quarterback get the ball out of his hand early again. You know, I have a hard time believing Devontae Smith and A.G. Brown couldn't get open. Mm-hmm. I have a hard time believing that Jalen Hurts was back there just holding the ball because, you know, he was just scared to throw it the entire time. I, I firmly believe there were, there were moments throughout the season, many moments where he was looking out there and just saying, I, I can't throw the ball over there because they're too close to each other. It's 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 a, you know, it's a walking time bomb. So I, 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 I'm i looking forward to killing more and, and, and Doug Newsmeyer and even Nick Sirianni, whatever he can offer at this point. I'm looking forward to seeing what new wrinkles they can provide to accentuate the talents of these, you know, uh, you know, to accentuate the talents of their personnel. Again, the offensive identity, in my opinion, is uh, one of the things that I think needs to be fixed along with um, the cornerback room. Uh, what's your next one? Right, I'm going to go over. I'm going to go to um, this. This falls on Vic Fangio and Clint Hurt. What happened to the D line last year? It was the best defensive line in football the year before. 70 sacks. Uh, you know, number one against the pass. I mean, literally number one against the pass. Kind of middle of the pack against the run, but that didn't really matter because your pass rush was so dominant. How did you fall back to 43 sacks? Last nine weeks, you were gutted on the ground. And, you know, you have a lot of money invested in that in those positions, whereas in linebackers, you were kind of hoping. Safety, you were kind of hoping. You know, what happened to your D-line? Because you're not going to be able to fix everything on the back seven this offseason. you got to get your D-line right. So where Absolutely. where did it go wrong? Like, were you not playing to their strengths? Was it too much of, of Reddick dropping into coverage or sweat or whatever? you got to get to the bottom of that. Clint Hurt and Vic Fangio have got to figure out their D-line. That's a great point. Look, let's be frank about it. You only switched out really one guy. On that D line from 2022 to 2023, of, you know, of importance, and that yeah. was Javon Hargreaves. Now, granted, I will say this as well that this this doesn't get talked about enough. Another big difference between 2022 and 2023 is the Philadelphia Eagles had legitimate depth at that D tackle spot. You know, along with Jordan Davis and Fletcher Cox and Milton Williams and Montu Pelotu, you had. Linval Joseph and Dominica Sue. You know what I mean? Those are legitimate guys who have been at the pinnacle of their position, right? Yeah. Cle- clearly on the back end, but Linval Joseph was spectacular, in my opinion. So they lacked depth in key spots. Hence why you saw a guy like Josh Sweat playing his, a career high in snaps. But ultimately, you're right. When you got a D line that has this, um, that's this, that's this talented. And you think about the range of ages and how it's a good combination of veterans and youth and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You got three first round draft picks and Fletcher Cox, uh, Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter. You look at that D line and say, how is this even possible? Yeah. So, so that's why, you know, that's why when I hear people say, nah, it's no way Nick Sirianni lost his locker room. It's no way. I'm like, I have a hard time rolling with that. What we we saw a seven game demise, a seven week, eight week demise. It's right. hard for me to say with a straight face. Nah, he didn't lose the locker room. No, no way. I know, it's, man. I, I just I can't. Know. Like, I just can't roll with that. Two, three weeks, stuff happens. Right. Even yeah, yeah. Right. Two or three well, weeks. United okay. lost three straight weeks. That right. happens. Th- this was way. We were way past that, and and it wasn't like, again, it wasn't where you're saying. Dude, the offense sucked. The defense only gave up 12 points per game. They showed up every week. If, if that if that was the case, then you just isolate it to something. Right. You'd almost feel better about this. I thought both sides really, 
you know, that, came that's up. the thing, Rob. You can't isolate the Eagles' issues. You no. can't. You can't. You can't say, you know what? Okay, if they were better here, this would change. No, you cannot isolate their issues. Their issues were so overarching. Their issues was like a virus, and it just it 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 it, it, it was just literally just taking over yeah, parts of your everything. body. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. First, it was a headache. Then it was a sore throat. Then it was, you know, the sniffles. And then now body weakness and aches. And it was just a virus. Mm -hmm. You can't sit here and tell me Nick Sirianni kept that locker room intact the entire time. You just can't. No. He didn't. Okay. And that's a fact. And that's, again, this is where he's got to figure this thing out and just understand right. and why. Rob, that remember, case. players look for answers. You know, players, yeah, they're the talent, you know, and – the 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 the, uh, the role coaches play is being able to make them better, and players respect coaches who can make them a little bit better, right? right? Just 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 a smidge, you know. Players they don't care about, you know. We always hear about, oh yeah, players they like this guy, that guy. Okay, yeah, that happens. But for the most part, I think above all else, if I had to guess, and I, I've never been, I've never been in an NFL locker room, all that kind of stuff. But if I had to surmise, and based off of the people I talk to. Players care about if you can make them better. Can you get them out of a jam? Do you have the answers when things are kind of not or things are kind of looking bleak? Can you do? Can you figure those? Can you be a problem solver? Mm -hmm. And not one time through that eight week stretch or seven week stretch, however you want to slice it, was Nick Sirianni a problem solver? So again, how can we all say here? What is? Can we? How can some of us say, Nah, he didn't lose that locker room. It's all in the players. I mean, yeah, the players got to wear it too, but yeah, come on, man. I can't no, say Nick, I, on, I can't. Man. I can't say Nick kept that locker room on you know on the same page throughout that seven eight game stretch. It it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. All right, give me your you have, you have a third one. Yes, my third one is the linebacker room. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, newsflash, right? Uh, the linebacker room has to be just overhauled. Yeah, um, it looks like. If I had to, if I had to guess, Zach Cunningham was probably going to come back on a one year deal, something like that. You never know. Um, but if I had to guess, it'd be him. And then yeah, the way how he praised him in that press conference, I think Zach Cunningham's back. Right. And then Kobe Dean, the way he, you know, hitches his wagon to him, the Kobe Dean is probably going to be penciled in as a starter. But in my humble opinion, you and I talked about this. Nicole Dean should have to compete for every snap. He should have to compete for water. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. uh, he has to stay healthy too. That's another thing. Um, but I think they need to um, add some depth to that position. It was a huge mistake um, rolling the dice on uh, Christian Ellis being able to make it do waivers. Huge mistake. Um, they need to reload in that position. They need, they need to get high-quality talent. And I think they need to just ultimately alter the profile of the players they're going after at that position. Um, the Kobe Dean, he's a small dude, man. Small dude. I think they need some more size back there, some more athleticism, some more length. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But I think that linebacker room is something that needs to be top priority. But we'll see, man. Nick, um, Harry Roseman is um, a man who definitely leans on habit and procedure rather than um, bucking the trend. Well, hey, hey, let me pick up on the linebacker thing and two things that scare me. One, uh, Zach Cunningham was the best of a bad lot. Right. That could be very dangerous. Like, you know, we heard, we heard last year about Nicholas Morrow in Chicago. Look at all the tackles the guy had. Yeah, he had a lot of tackles for a bad defense. And we saw what he was here. It wasn't special. So I worry about that a little bit with Zach Cunningham. I also worry, and we've, we've talked to Tone, three people, maybe four people who cover the team who all think that Kobe Dean will be penciled in as a starter. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't like either one of those two developments, frankly. Uh, it makes me think they'll probably go after one linebacker that they think can make a difference. But it should be more than that. It should be multiple linebackers that they're making priorities here. So, and I'm sure if you talk to those people that we spoke to on air, I'm pretty sure if you speak to them off air, they'll say they need to look beyond the Kobe Dean. I know. But ultimately, they're just speaking from the perspective of what they think the organization is going to do rather than what they think they should do. I'm not, I always no, wanna, that's I'm exactly not, right. I, yeah, and I always want to make that clear. Um, you know, most of the people that say likely the Kobe Dean is going to be penciled in as a starter, they're operating from the perspective of what the team is likely to do rather than what they think they should. Cause I'm pretty sure if you ask any reporter, they think they should um, probably draft the linebacker second round, maybe, maybe higher than that. You never know, but that's not what the Eagles do. Yeah, exactly. All right. So that, that I I'm with you. And, and here's my last one. Talent. Talent. Yeah, yeah. They lack talent. Okay? Yeah, they need more depth, yeah, depth and talent. Yep. Yep. But that, that goes to hand in hand. You're right. Think talent and depth. It. Yeah. You're not nearly talented at linebacker enough or at safety, at corner. Uh, you you 
like to me, at each of those positions, you can make a case to clean it out completely. Now, we know the real the reality of a salary cap. You're not doing that. You're going to roll with Slay again, which is fine. Uh, you can't roll with Bradbury again, um, and they might. And you, you're you going to take a gamble probably on another year of Ante Maddox when he gets hurt every year for significant time. That's the, they're bo- All those things are problematic. You need another safety, and I, I hope they don't just view it as, well, we'll get Sidney Brown back at some point. Like, you can't bank on that. And, right. and he got hurt late in the year, too, on top of everything else. So I, I hope that they don't just go the route of Sidney Brown, Eli Ricks, uh, Keely Ringo. Everything's going to be fine. I don't think they will, but if they do, man, big mistake, Tone. They need to get like real proven guys in here or high pedigree guys coming out of college that you make your priority in the first and second, third round. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the Eagles, they have some work to do in this offseason. Yeah. Let's not, you know, let's not be short about it. They, they have, they have an uphill climb. Um, I think. When it comes to getting his defense back on track, I think it's more than just a, a, sing, a single offseason that's going to take to get this team back on track. Um, we have seen situations where teams flip their fortunes in one season. We've seen it. Um, but typically those teams, they have money to spend. Um, they got capital or, or however you want to slice it. Um, the Eagles, from a, from, a, from a fiscal standpoint, they're a bit limited. And from a draft pick standpoint, I think they have nine right now. Maybe they get more. Right. Maybe they trade some away. You never know. But ultimately, um, they're kind of, working with a they're kind of working with a short deck here and we're going to see how savvy Harry Roseman can be. Yep, we are. We sure are. All right, let's hit it. Let's come back. Keith Pompey is going to join us. We'll get the latest on what's happening Peace. with Joel and Bede. Uh we're going to swing it back to the birds in the next segment. And one of the things we're going to discuss is breakout players. And by the way, Tone, and I don't want to overlook this and we won't overlook it. We lost a great on Friday. Yes. Uh great. Uh, Carl Weathers, rest in peace, but we will we will pay him some due as well since we haven't had the opportunity to talk about it. And I know it would a fan, you and I are both of his. Uh, so we Absolutely. will do that as well when we come back. But Keith Pompey coming up next. Don't go anywhere. He's telling um, Rob, let's talk about Jim Murray and Principal Financial Group because knowing who to trust with your finances is priority one. Uh, you work too hard, right? And it's too important to take care of yourself and your family uh, with, with someone who does not know what they're doing. Okay. And I found the right person and it's Jim Murray and principal financial group, whether it's retirement planning, 401k review, insurance review, you might have a small business and you need help with your employee benefits. That is another resource that Jim can help you with. I know I've entrusted my IRA, my 401k rollovers with Jim, and I couldn't be any happier. You will be too. Give him a call. 610-996-4751. 610-996-4751. Or you could email him as well. Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y dot jim at principal.com that's murray dot jim at principal.com go to get your game on go for the beers go for the cheers go for the hit and the hits go for the stakes and the stakes go to get your parlay on go to get your party on go for the scene go for the screens go for the gallery Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. They're carving them up and good play calling along the way. First and goal at the six. On the field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Thank <laughs> you. 
Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. What is up, everybody? Appreciate you hanging out. Uh, hope you're doing well out there. Let me throw, before we bring Keith up, um, Tone, the other thing, just to stay on the th- on the theme of what we were discussing here, uh, right. what needs to be you know, fixes, et cetera, it's not priority one. That's why I didn't put it in my top three, but it's something that, that they need to address. Mm-hmm. Their depth's not good enough. Their depth right. at, let's think about this, Tone. If you're not able to get a deal done, with Reddick or Sweat, you, you're you know you're rolling into their last years at the edge, and which is other than quarterback and, and probably whoever's protecting that quarterback's blind side, it might be the third most important position. You you and you lack depth there anyway because let's face it, BG's not the same player he was, and we don't know about Nolan Smith. So you, you got to you, you got to address that position. Your wide receiver depth stinks after the top two who are studs. Okay, you fall off a cliff. Your tight end depth after Dallas Goddard is not acceptable. And, right. you know, if Kelsey retires, I don't know how good your offensive line depth is either. And keep in mind, Driscoll and Opeta are free agents who could walk. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're thin in some spots here. That's why, that's why, you know, whenever we, you know, we talk about the Philadelphia Eagles, I try to be as honest as I can. Um, you know, you guys see, I am a fan of the team. I love this team. Grew up watching them. But, you know, there's going to be moments where we got to just be honest with ourselves and call it what it is. And when you look at this roster from top to bottom, especially guys that they have on contract, guys that may have a contract expiring, um, the, their money situation, um, the draft, it's, they have a lot of ground to make up from a depth perspective, from a talent perspective on defense, um, the offensive identity, ironing that out, um, reinvigorating. Um, the defense, you know, you and I had a, a topic that we were going. I don't know if we're going to talk about it now, save it for later. But yeah, um, we're gonna save it. Fact, we, probably, we probably should save it for later because we got our guy Keith in the building. That's you right. Know what I'm That's I right. got Mister Pompey is in the is, is we in the house. Do not keep my man uh, waiting. Okay, absolutely. Uh, we do not keep keep Keith Pompey uh, waiting, and he joins the Don us. Dada. There he is. What's up, man? Hey, Keith. Tone, I'm loving the cut, bro. Hey, listen, yeah, right? hey, hey, listen. Yeah, I appreciate you, listen, brother. Crew. <laughs> Keith, we we want to keep viewers, not have them scurrying away. If I shave my head, man, people oh, will, man. their eyes will be bl- will be burned out of their their sockets, Keith. If I do that, yeah. <laughs> see, Tone's probably doing it for fashion. I had to. Nah, do it nah, I mean, hey, hey, listen, I, I listen. Uh, for disclosure, Keith, when I was about 17, 18, I said to myself, uh, "It's gonna go." I already know. <laughs> really, you knew. <laughs> so I, I, I wrapped my mind around it early. And, uh-huh. then, and then and then I decided to do it a few months ago, and here we are, man. I'm not, now now I feel like you, man. I feel like yeah. a, a beautiful chocolate man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. The only bad part is my daughter. Oh, get this. My wife has never. We've been married for over 20 years, and she has never seen me with hair. That's how Ooh. bald I've been. I've been oh, bald you? for a while, dude. I was a young bald guy. Yeah, but it was either that or having a hairline like this. Having a, John yeah, Ryan used to call them bowling alleys. That's what he used yeah. to call bowling yeah, alleys. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't want lane five and six. You know? <laughs> and then, uh, real quick, before we can start on the sports stuff. Uh-huh. Funny we talking about this. Last night, me and my wife were talking. And she was like, look, Tone, I'm going to be honest with you. Earlier on when you had hair and I saw the way your hairline was going, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to pay you no mind. I wasn't oh. sure if I was going to let you, you know what I mean? That's rough. That's <laughs> rough. Like, 
I'm, I'm, I'm like, damn, babe, when was you gonna tell me this? She said, Well, we're here now, so it don't matter. You know, <laughs> I, I love I love the ball hair, I love the beard, so you good. I'm like, okay, say less. I roll with it. Hey man, Jordan, Jordan changed the game in a lot of ways, but he changed the game with shaving the head, too. Let's face it. Yeah, he did. You go he back did. and look at some of that stuff in the 70s yeah. and 80s, and dudes have the George Jefferson going, man. Yeah. It's not a good look. You're right. You know? Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely yeah. right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, well, <laughs> never thought we'd be talking about this today, Keith. All right. So no, right? <laughs> yeah. let's uh let's start with the MB thing. And all right, so here's what we know. He's gonna get a procedure, meniscus injury, displaced flap of the meniscus. And you you think it may be six to eight weeks, but ultimately till you open somebody up, you really don't know for sure, right? So is it's kind of where we're at right now, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the bingo. Until you open someone up, you, you you don't know. Like I was funny this morning, I, I was talking to a doctor, um, Dr. Megan Bishop at Rothman, uh, you know, great doctor. She used to work for the Knicks. And, and she was like, that's it, you bingo. She said, like, everyone can say what they want. But until you open that that thing up and you see what the need looks like, then you may decide, like, you know what? Uh, uh you know, we, 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 we may have to repair it or we may just have to snip it. What she was saying is that the repair thing is the best option, like for long term. Right. That's the best option for it. But she said with that, he's going to be out for like maybe four months. Right. So he's not going to be able to play in the season now. Like but if he gets the uh, if, if he just gets it cut, the snip and everything like that. Yeah. Joel will probably be back by the end of next month if he does that. Now, the only thing is with Joel, we all know that he gets out of shape very, yeah. very quickly. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you got to get the ramp up the thing and, and, and this and that. Now, here's the scary part that a lot of people aren't talking about. This is the second meniscus injury that Joel has had in that knee. Oh, people wow. forget. You remember his in 2017, he had surgery for a torn meniscus in the left knee. So this is the second injury that he's had in this knee. So that's the scary part. You, you know, Keith, Joel Embiid, he's clearly one of the most dominant players that we've, you know, that we've seen play the game. And uh, we see how dominant he's been this season. But it's gonna, there's going to come a point in time when the Philadelphia 76ers have to ask themselves, yes, he gives us these great moments, but is this somebody that we should invest in beyond this current contract? What, look, how, how do you think the Philadelphia uh, 76ers, you know, balance, you know, the, you know, and Joel Embiid's injury history with his dominance? Like, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, he, I think he has, what, like four more years left on that deal. So it's, it's going to be a long, long one. The thing about Joel and it's real, um, it's a great question, but it's one of those things where when you ask yourself when he's healthy. Now, again, we know the injury history. But 10 days ago, people were bringing up Wilt Chamberlain, saying, like, is he better than Wilt? Is he this, dom you know, the most dominant guy? So, and even if you try, like you say, like, do we move forward? And the best thing to do is you say to yourself, if we're not going to keep him, maybe we should trade him and get something, right? Yeah. Now, I think if you trade Joel Embiid, you're basically going back into rebuild. You're, you're going to get draft picks and everything like that. Because I don't know that there's another player out there that, that you're going to be able to get to get equal value. Now, you may say, I'm going to get Giannis Antetokounmpo, but the Milwaukee Bucks are not going to trade him. And then you may say, OK, well, let's go get the Joker. And Denver's not going to trade him. So the other all-stars that you have, like a Kevin Durant or people like that, they're like on the decline of their career, like the Steph Currys. You're not going to trade for those guys right now you're just not and i just feel like that you're like you're not going to get equal value look at the knicks when the knicks were ready to throw all-stars at them right also and people laughed and julius randall was an all-star and they laughed at some of their young their young assets no one wanted it so if you're trying to trade joel and b you got to be even though he's injured yeah. and the fact that he's injured no one's going to give you a lot and then also it's just not you're not going to match the production that you think you should get for Joel. So, and my thing is, it's tough to get rid of him, man. It really is. It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll, I'll go out for a second. I'm going to go glass with a little bit in it. I'm not even going half full here, Keith. But I, I'd rather this than him try and just rest it and dr be dragging it around through a playoff series when we know he's not right. And every time he goes down. 
you know, you're holding your breath and you're, you're, oh man. And maybe in a weird way, you, you make a great point about his conditioning. Maybe in a weird way, at least his body isn't as beaten down as it usually is once the playoffs start. And he gets like a three week ramp up before the playoffs start, if all goes well. Right. And he, and he gets back say mid to late March. I know I'm giving you like eight scenarios here that have to work out right, but there is, there is like a vision where you could see this maybe, maybe working out for them better than we've seen in years past where he just, you know, he just falls apart physically. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and here's the thing. We talk about 2017. The one thing people forget is like, so 2017, they initially thought it was a bone bruise, right? Yeah. So you remember he was out there dancing at like the Meek Mill concert, yes. whatever. I can't dance as good as him. So I'm sorry if I'm embarrassed. He, he can't yeah. dance either, but you good. <laughs> so, so what happened is, so he, he missed 15 consecutive games where they thought he was going to rest it up and it never got better. So he ended up having to get surgery. So you are raising a, a, a raising a great point. It's kind of like, okay, we can say we're going to rest it up. We're going to do this. We're going to like make him like see what his pain tolerance is like. And then next thing you know, he's going to be done for the season anyway. So it makes a lot of sense for him to have this surgery now because you know, when he comes back, hopefully he'll be pain free, right? He'll be pain free if everything goes well. But then also he can move forward because he's going to miss time. Like, I mean, here's the thing. We saw him play against Indiana and he looked horrible. And then when they went up against Golden State, it went down three notches, his level of play. Like he can't continue to have games like this. And you think that the 76ers are going to be able to win a playoff series, right? Right. So, you know, you are 100 percent right. I think that the best thing that's going on with the with the injury, uh, the ramp up, all that stuff is that Joel Embiid is, is smart to have this procedure now. Mm-hmm. How much do you believe that the whole new rule surrounding all NBA and the MVP, the 65 game limit? How much of that do you think played into Joel Embiid kind of forcing it out through those past few games? I think 50 percent. I think the other 50% was that he was called out by by uh, media members, by um, fans, by everyone else. I feel like, you know, if, 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 if it was the old league, and not old league, but they didn't have this, you know, 65% thing, I felt like Joel probably would have been on the shelf for like five games. They might have said that. And then they would have came back and said, we're going to give it a try to see what he can do, right? Um now, again, apparently when he got the MRI, it shows some dangerous things, right? But beforehand, I think mm-hmm. they would have rested it. But so I think that had a lot to do with it because, you know, Joel can come out to you and say whatever he wants about how he didn't want to be the MVP. He wanted to become the MVP. He wanted to be first team all NBA. That's all a part of legacy for these players. They all want it, right? But they also think the other thing is, you know, when he was in Denver and, and I I think we lost key for a hey, second. I think we Keith, if you can hear us, we we got you froze uh you froze up. We're tone's gonna try and get you get you straightened uh, out here. Uh there, there we go. Oh yeah, we got you. Yeah, now we got you. We, go. we lost you for a second there, man. For a brief moment. But but if you think about it, even on ESPN, they said like I don't want to say it here, but they said some derogatory things about Joel and B, right? So I feel like with all that being said, it was a matter of Joel felt like he had to man up and prove yeah. everyone wrong. And also he wanted to get the MVP. How, how much though on that for a minute, Keith, I know it's really hard in that league to tell stars, you know, what to do. And Joel is, is the, you know, the, the biggest star here. Did some of that fall on the organization, like trying to protect them against himself and police them against himself where they just don't frankly have the guts to stand up to him. Yeah. I mean, especially that like, okay. I don't know if y'all were watching the Golden State game. Did y'all see it? I watched it. Did you see that one play when he was running on defense? He and went he up right by the basket and went and right down. And went yeah. down. At that point, that it buckle. was over. He yep. should have been done. Like, it was over. Yeah, and yeah. and not only that, he was, like, he was hurting himself, but he was also hurting the team. Yeah. There was a point where they went to the – he went to the bench and the Sixers went on a run, and then he came back. Like, and you're saying to yourself, I can't believe they're bringing him back in the game for two reasons. He can't play. And number two, it's like 
he's he, he's being 40 percent of himself and he's hurting the team. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you got to blame the team, man, especially. I mean, that's one of those things where, you know, we see it in every sport, all sports. Like if your team is getting blown out or if you're up to a huge league, you always say, get the star player out of there because he's going to get hurt. And that was a prime example. Four minutes and four seconds left in the game. What happens? They go for a loose ball. The guy lands on his knee and he's done. He's done. So, yeah, I blame the team, too. Like the team could have done a better job of getting him out of there. And you are right. He is a superstar. He does what he wants to. But on those particular instances, that's when somebody has to be the adult, the adult in the room and say, Joel, you got to sit down, bro. You got to sit down. That's why, you know, it, it was kind of shocking. You know, Nick Nurse has kind of built up equity with the with this team a little bit. Um, he's it was kind of shocking that Nick Nurse didn't see right on the wall a little bit. Um, how much pressure is on Nick Nurse right now, you know, to kind of coach up this uh, the, this limited Sixers team and at least get them into playoff contention, knowing Joel Embiid's down again. We don't know when he's coming back, if he's gonna come back, but how much pressure is on Nick Nurse um to kind of keep um this team above water? Well, I think all the pressure is gone now. But um, <laughs> but, but but before that, yeah, I mean, let's let's face it. Nick Nurse came here. He said, regardless of who's going to be on the roster, the goal is to get out of the second round. He said that's something that we're going to talk about. You know, this and that. And when you look at it, this was a bad road trip in many reasons. For many reasons, because not only they only played like one real legitimate team, and that was the Denver Nuggets. You know, Utah, I mean, excuse me, Indiana is okay, but they're they're battling injuries, right? And the Sixers, they they played horribly. Like, they played very awful. They got guys who are banged up, nicked up, and now, like, they're sliding. They slid from number three to number five. So with that being said, yes, there is pressure because they went from being a team that we felt like the first time they played the Boston Celtics as a team that can come out of the East. To now they're being they're playing like a team that's trying to avoid the play-in game. So with mm -hmm. all that being said, playing tournament, with all that being said, yes, there's a lot of pressure on Nick Nurse to do something. But I also think that what he was doing is, if you notice, he was allowing Joel Embiid to get these minutes so he can continue this streak, do whatever he wants, right? But there was a time when Nick and everybody should have just shut it down and say, look, Joel, we love you, man. You may be upset with us for the rest of this season, but we're doing this for your health so you can have a longer career. That's a great point. All right. Now, I want to ask you about the trade deadline and how much the Embiid injury impacts this, Keith. I, I mm. guess it's sort of two-part, right? And it's Thursday, by the way. But did you think they were going to go uh, – I'm not going to say all in, but they were going to go with a, with a bigger name guy if Joel had stayed healthy, and now they won't. Does this force their hand to get somebody, get Maxi some help where he doesn't have to drop a 51 spot just for them to win? Like, how, how do you think Maury goes about it now in light of the Embiid injury? You know, the, the thing is, I, I think personally, if, if I'm Daryl Maury, um, I'm hoping that the, the surgery is either today or tomorrow. And then I can see what the timeline is going to be before I make a decision, right? Because I feel like if Joel Embiid is going to be out for four months, regardless of who you bring in here, they're not going far, right? right. We need Joel. But I, I think that right now, if, if I'm the 76ers, my focus would be on bringing in a center, right? I, I think that I would, if I don't have to pay too much, I think I'm going to Chicago placing calls saying, I need Drummond. You got to give me Drummond. Because I feel like he's a guy who can hold down the fort, not as well as Embiid, but he can hold down the fort at least through the rest of the, regular season until mb gets back right mm -hmm. so to me that's the number one priority now the thing is if you go out there and some people are saying yeah let's go out there and, and get another wing player perimeter player that's great but how is that player and maxi going to coexist together you know what i mean that's my main question because maxi's an all-star now he's that guy like he wants to get calls he wants to be the number one option so to me, yes, you can go get somebody that's going to help you out. But at the same time, is it going to be how much is that going to take away from Maxie's growth? But to me, I think you got to go out there and at least try to go get Drummond. You have to try to go get Drummond. Keith, you know, um, w with everything looming around the Joel Embiid injury and how optimism around the season is definitely taking a nosedive. 
what's the overall energy in the building, you know, at the Wells Fargo, you know, with the players and the staff and just, again, like just the, what's the overall energy that you're getting in the building, um, especially after this Joel Embiid injury? Well, you know, it's funny because they have a really veteran team, right? A lot of guys who are wise, a lot of guys, when they get injured, they know their bodies and they, they try to go through the tests. And, and if they're not ready to play, they're not going to play. Like, I mean, but like they'll help the team, but if they feel like it's going to be really detrimental to them, you know, the thing that if I'm talking to certain guys off the record, they were a little disappointed because mm-hmm. they felt like the 65 games, they felt like the, uh, you know, um, they felt like the way people were calling Joel out, it forced him to not think. And it forced him to come back to prove people wrong when he knew that he couldn't do it. Right. So that's the sense right there that I'm getting from the players are like, man, you know, you, you, you allow peer pressure to get you. Now they don't really fault him. They, they feel like people should have known that this guy wasn't right. Right. Instead of just throwing stuff out. So that's the sense that I get from them. But then at the same time, you know, a lot of these guys are on expiring deals, too. So while they're worrying about Joel, they're also worrying about how this is going to impact them. If there will I be a 76er come Friday morning? So mm. we have a lot of this going on right now. A mm. lot. Uh, that is interesting. Do, do you think, Keith, in your estimation, I know Zach Levine was out of the mix with the with the foot surgery, et cetera. But did you think that they were going to go in on somebody had Joel stayed healthy? Or do you think it would have been a depth guy, you know, a la Drummond? I know Drummond's specific because Joel's out, but were they were they going to go that sort of backup route? Because Maury wants the offseason with the clear deck and he can he can kind of go all in. Yeah, I think it was going to be a backup <laughs> route just because you look at it and if you thought – so if, if you believe that Tyrese Maxey can continue to send the way he is and he is an all-star, right, and, and then you look at it, you know he's going to demand a max contract this summer, right? So you have him, you have Embiid, and then right now we don't know what Tobias is going to do, but Tobias is a, a solid third scorer. So basically what you need is you need a guy who's going to be a fourth scorer or a guy who's going to be like a quality role guy to provide the depth, to do some other things. Like a guy who I felt like would have been good would have been like, if you want a forward, maybe a Jeremy Grant, you know, mm. a guy who improved his game, you know, uh, or – as a DeJounte Murray. Now, DeJounte Murray, you know, he was an all-star. He does this. But what he – you're looking at him as his length with um, with the injuries the Sixers are having at the guard spot, a guy who could come in and fill in and be a good defender, a guy who Maxi could play off. Those are the type of guys. Like, they're not necessarily look to be like the Zach Levine or DeMar DeRozan type of guy that's going to come in here and average 30-something points, right, and mess up the chemistry. They were going to be guys who can come in here, provide defense, give scoring when need be, but be more of a a championship builder as opposed to being a, an all star. Makes sense. Now, Keith, you know, obviously the Joel Embiid injury changed everything in terms of their game plan with the, at the trade deadline, so on and so forth. But um, how how serious are these Tobias Harris rumors that are going around about him potentially being trade bait? And I, I I read the Pistons are potentially trying to make a you know you know make a play for him. We know he has an expiring contract. So how legitimate are those rumors around Tobias Harris? I mean, these are the same teams that have been wanting Tobias Harris since last summer. Like you know, and and the thing is, you know, people want him, um, but you know, it could change now that uh, uh, Joel Embiid is hurt. But Daryl Morey has been adamant for a while that he's not trying to get rid of Tobias. I mean, the you know, whenever somebody calls and asks for Tobias, like the Cleveland, for instance, last summer, he was asking for some crazy stuff. Like, you know, I want your whole front court, you know, all stars and everything for Tobias. They're not going to do it. Right? right. They're just not. The question that people have with Tobias, when you look at Tobias Harris. So the thing is. See, it's two things that really hurts Tobias Harris and something that people don't really talk about. So Tobias Harris is making $39 million this year, right? But if you trade him, you got to, the Sixers have to pay him an additional $9 million. So which is, is he would get the full max. So if you're the team that takes Tobias Harris, right, you have to, that's going to be on your salary cap. The Sixers will pay it, 
but you have to pay that extra nine on a salary cap for a lot of teams. Then you got to pay that tax. So right. the thing is, if you want to buy us, you got to make a hundred percent sure that that's a place that Tobias Harris wants to be at next season. If not, the owner's going to call you in the room and say, you mean, especially Detroit, you mean to tell me we pay tax. We're the worst team in the league and we pay tax on a guy that's going to walk at the end of the year. Mm. Right. So that's the things that a lot of people aren't talking about. That's a great point. You know, you got to be careful for that. You have to be a hundred percent careful for that. Now it's easy to name certain teams that, have the cap space because what it is is it makes it seem a little bit more believable and likely that it's going to happen. But at the same time, I'm telling you, that's how general managers get fired. And I don't know if the Sixers want to give them that extra $9 million. All right, Keith, last one for me. Thanks for the time as always, man. Uh, Definitely. We, we haven't seen you know, Anthony Melton in a long time. Um, you know, I know. I think some of the other stuff, you know, Tobias not feeling well, and and you know, some of the I don't know about Covington, but some of the other stuff doesn't seem all that severe. Batum, should should the melt thing be talked about a little bit more? I mean, he he's been out for a long time. Yeah, he's been out for for a minute. I mean, now I, I spoke to him. I want to say when when was it? Was it? Uh, I believe it was Friday. I spoke. No, I spoke to him Thursday. I spoke to him Thursday after the Utah game. And he told me at that particular time that his goal was to come back and play on Monday night tonight. Okay. Okay. Now it was one of those, so we'll see what happens, but it was one of those things where um, that was his second day that he did on court stuff. So he did a, a on court workout for like 20 minutes all out. And then he did some cardio stuff. So he did that on Thursday. He also did it on Tuesday. And then, you know, yesterday I looked at it as if, so I'm going to do that then. And then what the Sixers are going to have is they'll have me practice on Sunday. And then what they'll do is they'll monitor how his body is reacting. But that was it. Today was his target date for him to return. But it was one of those things where, you know, we're talking about a back injury. And I was amazed to, to, to find out that he didn't do anything for a while. Like he was just resting his back, doing, getting the treatment but he wasn't on the court at all. So, you know, so today should be today. Today okay. should be the day. And if not, then, you know, maybe the body just didn't respond the way that they wanted it to. Yeah. Uh, they have uh, the tonight. Yeah. yeah uh, last one from me, Keith. Um, again, we appreciate you for coming on making time for us as always. Um, you know, earlier I asked you about the overall temperature, you know, with the team regarding the Jonah B injury specifically, you know, what's the temperature with Tyrese Maxey right now? And how do you, uh, expect him to step up, uh, uh, step up with Jordan B. Ben. Now, what's your expectation for him going forward, knowing what we know? Um, the 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 thing is, I mean, I, you know, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like Maxi uh, is is getting better. I, I do like that Utah game game showed a lot, right? You know, that was the first time that I felt like he was able to go out there and impose his will when Joel and B wasn't on the floor. So that said a lot. I, I still I know he's an all star, mm -hmm. but I still feel like that he still has to progress a little bit. He still has to grow a little bit. And, and that's just because he's a young player. Right. But and, and I feel like a lot of the veterans, they may agree with me. They love him, but they're they're here and they're nurturing him so he can get to that next level because they see all the potential. Right. But I mean, what's not to like about him? I mean, he's a, a fun loving guy. They all like. He gets out there, he goes, he progresses. I mean, he does whatever they want. And and just to say something, Rob, I just looked it up. Uh, Melton will not come back today. Not so today. he is off. Now, he wanted to come back today, okay. but he's not going to come back. I mean, back it's a today. back. You can't play around yeah. with backs, man. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. You know, real quick, um, Keith, um, it's funny. I love hearing Pat Bev talk about Maxi because uh, he's he's definitely taking him under his wing. And I think on his podcast, there was a moment where he was like – um. He was saying, "Yeah, you know, um, you know, you got to step up." Set in the third matter. As a matter of fact, you know, we need you to drop forty tonight. Matter of fact, you might not be able to do it. And I don't know. And all of a sudden, uh, Maxi responds. So, you know, yeah, that relationship between Pat Bev and Max, you know, can you, um, you know, take us into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny because you know Pat Bev has been a guy who, you know, because of his personality, you know, there's been certain teams, especially veteran laden teams, where they didn't, they, they, he wore out his welcome, so to speak. 
but it just seems like when he gets around a young team like the Minnesota uh, Timberwolves, right, uh, a little bit with the Chicago Bulls, some of their young guys, like he was a great vet. And I, I think the best thing is not just with Maxi, but when you saw when they were playing Denver as a timeout, he got guys lined up and he's going through pay, plays yeah. trying to let Paul Reed know what, what goes on. And and the funny part is that I like about Matt, I am like about uh, Pat, I think Pat, can get a little heated though, right? But he's the guy that cools off Nick Nurse, believe it or not. Like Nick will get after a ref. Pat will like hold on, and then Pat will go out there and talk to the referee, mm -hmm. right? So he does a lot of this leadership things that I didn't think he was would do. You know what I mean? So yeah. he's good for Maxi. I remember one night we were in the locker room and Maxi did something, and he was sitting there and he was like, All right, Tyrese, I'm about to leave, but if you need anything call me just call me and Tyree's like all right I, I I will I will so he's he's definitely there for that guy um to help with his progression that's great cool. that's great all right Keith thanks man uh so I tell everybody follow Keith at Pompeii on Sixers on Twitter in Philip Inquire inquire.com does an awesome job uh covering the team always on top of it and we look forward to uh to your stuff from uh, tonight's game Keith thanks man appreciate it thank you man I really Keith, appreciate you me, fellas and uh, my, I, my ball, ball brother I'm yes sir forward. my ball Baby, brother I'm next. Yes, I'm next. Rob. I'm next. <laughs> Rob, don't be scared it's coming soon anyway Keith you know what I mean I can only fight man. it for so long my friend uh, uh, thanks, all right thank you Keith. we appreciate all you man right. thanks Keith. All right, all right, take care right. Keith Pape uh kind enough to hop on let's get a quickie in here tone let's come back we're going to look at our breakout players um, yes. uh, from the Eagles this upcoming, going into the 24 season, guys who we think will step up. So we'll do that when we come back. Don't go anywhere. That is Tone. I am Rob. Uh, let's talk a little bit about ProAction Restoration. Yeah, ProAction Restoration. If you have a home, you have a business, and you've experienced the pain and the inconvenience of water, fire, smoke, or mold damage to your property, you know how trying that can be. ProAction Restoration is on call 24 hours, seven days a week. So Inconvenient time? Nope, there isn't one. Call them. All right, happens at night, holiday, weekend, early morning, whatever the case may be. Reach out to them. I did. I had water issues at my house. I had water issues at my parents' house way back in the day, and they helped out in both cases and in both spots as well. They work in conjunction with your insurance company, so everything is up to speed. All right, and that is critical. Trust me when I tell you that. Uh, they are licensed, bonded, fully insured, and they've been serving the tri-state area for more than two decades. Pro-Action Restoration can handle it all. Water, fire, smoke damage, mold remediation, you name it, they will be the people that you reach out to. Give them a call, 610-623-3760, 610-623-3760, or online at ProActionRestoration.com. That's ProActionRestoration.com. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank.
Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Back. What's up, everybody? Appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, we are, uh, that is, I am. <laughs> That's Tone. I'm Rob. Hope everybody's doing good. All right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You, see, you seem a little flustered, man. What you, what you, what you, what you, what you munching on over there? I, I, I was I was dealing with the dog, uh, first off. And I, so every time, I, I'll try in around 1230. So most of the time when we go to a break, I'm sitting there trying to look stuff up or whatever and blah, blah, blah. So I, I have to force myself to get up just to stretch my legs, just to get the blood flowing. All right. I'm not, right. I'm, I'm bad at that. So when I get up, I try to get a little snack. So I got, so my dog has, all dogs are kind of like this, has, even if she's like two flights up, can hear me. I grab a banana and I start unpeeling the banana and she hears it. And then oh. she wants to, you know, want, want something to eat. So I'm like, no, no, you're not getting any banana. You know, go, go do your thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll walk you later. I don't have time right now. You know, whatever. And she's begging and and I'm a sucker. So I break off a little piece and I give it to her. And this is what goes on in my house. And my wife says that Bailey, our, our little dog, is the master of me. And she's probably not wrong. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I think that's why my wife is uh trying to hold out on me because I want the dog bad. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think she's holding out on me because she knows that I'll become a sl- I'll, I'll become a slave to that dog. I'll just yeah. do that. That dog would get anything and anything out of me at any time of the day or night. I'm so easy. <laughs> so the other the other thing that she does too, which is wild. So she eats twice a day. She eats just like okay. this hard food that we have for. Her. She eats twice a day. So so generally six thirty seven a.m. She'll she'll you know when, when we're up she'll eat. Okay. So then she th- then it's like whatever whatever dinner time is five o'clock six o'clock. But she's got this it, in, internal clock now, where when it's like. 445 she starts you know looking at me and, and and like motioning almost motioning to the kitchen for her to eat i'm like no you're not, not eating n- not it's quite not time. so this, this these games go on all day long it's it's fun stuff that's all fun right. man um the life with a dog all right let, so let's hit a couple things uh i want to first touch on this so friday after the show uh come to find out that carl weathers passed away yes if you don't, if you're not familiar with the name, Carl Weathers was an actor who played, among others, Apollo Creed. He was in Predator. He played Chubbs in Happy Gilmore. I, I mean, there's mm-hmm. what, Mandalorian. There's way more than that. I'm just giving you like the real Cliff Notes version of this guy's career. Absolutely. F- fascinating guy. He uh, he was a an NFL player, played a couple years for the Raiders, then went to the CFL and played in the Canadian Football League got out of uh, football and went into acting and was a real relative unknown when Stallone cast him as Apollo Creed in 1976 in, in Rocky one. He was 28 at the time coming off his football career. 28, man. 28 looks different in the seventies, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> it, they look like grown ass men. In, in, in when, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Can't then. forget. He was in the Mandalorian as well. Played our guy grief Carga. Yeah. You know what I mean? One Whatever the, he was one, in one of the top bounty hunters. I always found him like there are certain guys that command the screen. There are certain actors that, you know, you just, they have it factors. Can't really describe it, but it's it. Yes. And when they're in a scene, I'm locked in on them more than I am virtually anybody else. Yes. Um, and, and I thought Stallone gave him a really nice tribute he paid to him. He said, uh, Beautiful. and you could tell like he was feeling it, man, because he had, you know, just found out. But but what he said, which I thought was really cool, was, hey, we we might have made Rocky, 
but it would not have been what it was without Carl Weathers. And Truly, said, think about it. Like, yeah. uh, like the, the whole when you really think about it from top to bottom, Apollo Creed is the a foundational character. He's like the linchpin of that franchise. So mm -hmm. much occurred in that franchise because of his presence, his existence. You know, it's I agree. Carl Weathers was a magical was a magical actor like you said. He just commanded the screen whenever he spoke. His 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 eloquence, his aura, oh, yeah. you know, he just had this, like you said, something you can't really measure. There, yeah. there was this energy about him that was just magical. And um, you know, I loved him in Predator because oh. obviously, you know, that there's that infamous scene at the beginning when uh, you know, when Dutch and Dylan <laughs> come across each other and they do the <laughs> The, they the, do the, the uh high it's not a high is it a high five it's not a high no, five no, it was it was an arm rust it was like they like it was like, like the, the meeting of the of the hands yeah and all two of a guys sudden, two guys with with biceps that, that, that went up to the you know empire state building right? the screen zoom was in on their biceps and, and oil up arms you know the whole thing yeah of course and you, it, it was it was so 80s and it was so 80s yes and, it was uh and dutch says what's the matter cia got to push too many pistols had enough and uh, Dylan says, "Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. Make it uh -huh. easy." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just you know, he just has iconic roles, man. And um, you know, I would never forget the Happy Gilmore when he says, "Um, what was that scene where he's like, it's all in the hips." Yeah, all in the hips. <laughs> playing yeah. the piano. I mean, there's so easy, just easing, just easing attention, just easing attention. Carl oh, Wellers is a legend, man. Um, and you know what? I love that he had a resurgence in the Mandalorian. You really saw his skill then as well. Yep. Um, Carl Weathers is um truly one of one, and like you said, Rocky, um, just of us alone, he truly, he truly understood the magnitude, the power of Carl Weathers, especially in that franchise, man. Yeah, he was just nothing short of brilliant. And and if you think about too, the last thing I'll say is, he 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 starts off as the foil, right? He's he's kind of the bad guy, so to speak, or whatever. Uh, the heel, yeah, the heel, if you will. Um, and then obviously things start to turn in, in Rocky Three. Those two become friendly. He trains Rocky the whole nine. But my point is. Even though he was the bad, sort of the bad guy, whatever, in the first two, you rooted for him. To like an extent, still, right? Yeah. You still felt compelled to root. And that's the ultimate bad guy. Like Tony Soprano was that way, if you're a Sopranos fan. Even though he was doing bad things, you liked Tony Soprano. You rooted for Tony mm -hmm. Soprano. You know what I mean? Like we could mention a million characters in The Wire that were like that. Yeah. But – Carl Weathers is that guy, man. I mean, he was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, one of the most iconic lines in film history, in my opinion. Um, the scene in Rocky Three, where um, the scene in Rocky Three where uh, you know they're sparring and Rocky just doesn't have it. He doesn't have it, and, and Carl's just tagging him up, just tagging yep. him up, and he's like, "Damn it, Rock! What are you doing?" Yep. He said, "Tomorrow, tomorrow. There is no tomorrow." Yes. There is no tomorrow. Yep. And that just that line is pure. It's true. You can apply it to any anything in life. Thing you are in life. Yep. You know there is no tomorrow. It's either now or never. You got to get up on the horse and take ownership of your situation. You know he took he took Rocky to the hood. He said he said you see these guys. He said uh I I I, I, I think Rocky said something like uh. You know, you know, what are they looking at? What's going on? Something no, like no. That. Paulie was like, what are we doing here? And, right. and Rock, he said, hey, Paulie's like, I don't like these people. And Rocky says, I don't think they like you. Like either, you. Paulie. Right. I don't yeah. like you either. Yeah. And, and, then, and then, and Apollo says to him, you see those guys, they got the eye of the tiger. Right. You need that back. That's why, that's that why he back. brought him there because he, he, he lost it. You know, he, he was making so much money. Yeah. He got, you know, he got ta ta fat, tagging fat. up everybody. He, he got fat. Yep. And you had, you know, you you had you had to get back, you had to get back to the gutter. You know what I'm yep. saying? And um, which you, I, I love how in those scenes they zoomed in on the, on the boxer's eyes, just eye and Rocky. Just he said, you know, he said they they look at you as like a like the the measuring stick. Yeah, you know what I'm saying they they all want a piece of you. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yep. Carl Weathers, rest in peace. Yeah, truly man. a legend. Truly a maverick. Um, one of the best um athletes turned actors that we've seen. Um, and you just saw him getting better with time. No doubt. Yep, no doubt. Uh, gone too soon, and I, I don't, I, I don't care that he was seventy six or seventy eight. We, we, we needed that guy around. He looked great for his age. Oh, he looked dude, great. He looked spectacular. Me? Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, all right. So just to to jump back here, um, uh, to the Eagles. So we went through kind of what what we uh, aside from Jalen, what needs to be fixed. But let's look at breakout players. Tone. Let's look at guys who. 
we saw a little bit from last year, or maybe we didn't see much from them, but we think either they have the capability to step it up or the team flat out just needs them to step it up. So why, why don't you throw one? I, I got a, I got a couple, but throw one, throw one our way first. Okay. One guy I think has potential to step up. Um, He had a, I, I say up and down season because he battled an injury a little bit, but whenever he was on the field, you saw a guy who was getting it. Um, A guy, Cam Jurgens. Um, this upcoming season can be is going to be huge for him ultimately because we have no idea what the future holds for Jason Kelsey. Hmm. We have no idea, you know, as much as I can surmise what I think must ha- may happen. You know, you have your opinion about it. Everyone has their opinion about what may happen, but we don't have no idea what's going to happen with Jason Kelsey. So as of right now, we have to look at Cam Jurgens as potentially being the future at center. Hmm. And um, although he did battle some injuries, I saw a player that, that got it. And, um, when he's feeling it, he can be a force. So I think Cam Jurgens is a guy that I'm looking to, uh, you know, to step his game up the following year, really come out strong. He's had two solid years um, under Jason Kelsey, really to see how things go, really, really to learn how to be a pro. Um, for me, just stay healthy, my man. And I think the world can be his oyster. Uh, I'm going to go Keely Ringo. I, I I believe in this guy, Tone. I like the size. I like the speed. I also have to take into account he was – 21, I think, last year. Mm, he, he very plays. young dude. Came out very young when you think yeah, about he it. probably should have played another year in college, frankly. But anyway, I, I'm glad the Eagles got him where they got him. But I think he's the one that takes that second-year leap. There's always a couple guys on teams that, that, that go from, from here to, to way up. And I think Keely Ringo's that guy. I think he's going to have to earn the starting spot. I'm not saying anything's going to be handed to him mm-hmm. going into next season. But I, I think from, from – from a, a he's big he can run uh the one knock on him one of the knocks on him in college he did have an injury but he was also a guy who committed a good amount of penalties but if you look at his numbers against some of the better receivers his last year at Georgia he did an excellent job on those guys so he's used to going against the big boys okay so I I really think that I think Keely Ringo is is going to be the guy that really stands out for us next year uh, in that in that defensive backfield you know I have one guy on this list, but I, I think I'm changing him out because it was too easy. Um, I'm going to say Milton Williams. Okay. I think because Milton Williams is entering a contract year, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Milton I think Williams. He's, I, I think he's entering a contract year because he was drafted in that Jalen Rager draft. He was okay. drafted. So he was, dra- he was drafted with year. Hertz. So yeah, let me double check that. But regardless, though. Yeah, I look at Milton Williams as a guy, and again, we may lose Fletcher Cox this season. We have no idea um, how this thing may go. But I'm looking at Milton Williams as a guy who has potential. Every time he's been on the field, he's been an impact guy, um, made plays. Uh, in that playoff game, in my opinion, he was arguably their best DT because okay. he 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 managed to get he managed to get into the backfield um more times than not. Um now obviously, you know, he's he's 24 years old. Uh, yes, he's entering a contract year, so this is a big year for him. And who knows if the Philadelphia Eagles even see if 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 he sees himself as a Philadelphia Eagle beyond this year? Because um, if he has a good year, I know he's looking to be a starter somewhere. I know he's looking to be um you know have a, you know be a large contributor. Um, and he's not going to be a starter here, especially with Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter in the fold. Now, obviously, we don't know what Jordan Davis' future holds because he needs to get his ass in the gym. But <laughs> I've always been a fan of him. Um, Ken out of Louisiana Tech. A lot of people had questions about him coming into the league with, with the Eagles, but you know he's he's always been a tweener, a guy that could play on the edge, um, could play you know um, right there in the, you know in, in the uh, heart of the defense, you know the three techniques so on and so forth. I really like Milton Williams' talent, I like his skill set. Um, I'm really looking forward to him coming in this year, especially in a contract year. Okay, I'm going to give you this one tone, and it falls distinctly in the category of they need him to do this versus I believe he'll do it. Okay. Nolan Smith. Mm, I forgot. That's a good one. I forgot about him. That's a good one. So, and here's the problem. I think we all do. I do too. So I think the way that we look at him a lot of times, and again, I do it too, is like he was taken in the fifth round. You look at his stats for a first round pick last year. Okay. They're horrendous. They're terrible. Okay. And, It's completely unacceptable because think about it. You had a situation where Brandon Graham, what he got like 20 something percent of the snaps and really it wasn't much of a factor. They let Derek Barnett go. They were begging for this guy to do something. Okay. They were begging for it. 
And last year he ends up getting one sack, 18 tackles, played all 17 games. I know it's not a ton of snaps before everybody starts losing their mind on me. Yeah, yeah, 147 snaps. So okay. um, I need more out of this guy. And there's a reason why they didn't trust him to put him on the on the field. That's he's has to be better than what he showed them last year. Yeah, he averaged about he averaged almost nine snaps a game. Um, look, regardless, you bring up a good point. If he was doing his job at a high level, they would have got him on that field sooner, right? I think I think that's something I need to wrap my mind around as well. You know, I tend to look at the team and say, well, why didn't you get him on the field in week one, week two, week three to try to get him, you know, try to get him involved consistently, right? That was my biggest thing because there, there were moments where they would drop, you know, put him out there one like one snap, two snaps in a game, and I'm like, how can he make a real impact? How can he prove what he's, you know, what he's learned or so on and so forth? But, um. On the back end, when he started to get more time, I saw a guy that I saw a guy that was regularly getting swallowed up by tackles. Regularly, it just seemed like all that speed that he did have, yep. you know, in the NFL, you can't just get by on speed alone. On you know, you know, on, um, you know, on hitting that hula hoop, you gotta, you gotta have some moves. You know, you gotta, you gotta have some deception. You know, you gotta have, you gotta have real technique on this level. These, you know, these tackles, they may not be as fast as you, but their technique is their, their technique and their footwork is so sound mm -hmm. that you can't just beat them on speed alone and power alone. So this is a big year for Nolan Smith, in my opinion. He has to come in and so much is hinging on his success, especially on the edge. The Eagles, they lack depth in several areas and they need him to hit because um, they got to take some pressure off Josh Sweat. Uh, BG is likely. Um, we have no idea what his future is. Let's be frank about that. No. Um, Hassan Reddick. Hassan Reddick, what's his future? You know, you know, from a financial perspective, both right. Josh Sweat really. Um, there's so much money that has to be figured out between Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick. Nolan Smith, you have he has to hit. Like, there's no if ands about to body. There's no, there's no half stepping. There's no one foot in, one foot out. Nolan Smith has to be a player. He has to he has to become a starter for the Philadelphia Eagles if they're going to remain on schedule in terms of their plans for that position. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I, look, I I think one of those guys, either Sweat or Reddick, will get. We'll have clarification on them going into the season. At least one of them. Somebody's going to get extended or 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 restructured, or something's going to happen mm -hmm. where you're not going in with both guys potentially walking. I don't think, at least. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is how you stay good. You, you draft Lido Shepard and Sheldon Brown back in the day, and, and then right. when Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent are ready to roll, you just you slide them in. This is what Nolan Smith should be. He should be a replacement for one of those guys, or mm -hmm. part of an incredible rotation. Either one, but. Um, this team needs him bad next year to be yeah. to be a contributor. Yep. And my final guy, um, I know some people are going to laugh at this guy. And I know some people are going to look at me like, Tone, seriously, really, this guy? But um, I'm looking forward to seeing the next chapter in Burton Covey's development as a punt returner. Because there were plenty of moments where I thought he was going to break that thing. This season. Yeah, he got close a couple and, of times. Um, yeah. He got close a few times, and he 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 flipped field position for the Eagles many a times. He was a mm -hmm. he was a breath of fresh air at that position. Return, I'll tell you that he had the second I think highest return average in the game. So he had right right. So I, I'm curious to see what Britton Covey does from a punt return perspective. I have no real expectations from him from a wide receiver perspective, but when it comes to the punt return and the special teams aspect of it, I'm curious to see what Britton Covey can add to the repertoire. Um, you know, and you know, in limited action like that. Um, I think Brent Covey is going to take at least one to the house next year. I can just feel it. So uh, I'm really excited to see Cam Jurgens take it to the next level. I'm really curious to see Milton Williams take it to the next level. And I'm curious to see what Brent Covey does to take it to the next level. If you notice, a lot of these guys that I mentioned, um, second round pick, fourth round pick, I believe Milton Williams was. So, uh, and then Brent Covey, I think he was an undrafted guy, if, you know, if, if, I, if I got that correct. So, yep. Yep. Um, well, I'm sorry, Milton Williams was a third round guy. So, yeah, if Covey you notice, he's. Right, right, right. So if you notice, I'm talking about these guys who aren't really um, big name guys or who who weren't really highly, you know, recruited or however you want to however you want to describe it. I, I, I'm I'm looking for these depth pieces to really step their weight up and potentially become starters or legitimate contributors in different ways. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way to put it. I mean, you have to have those kind of guys. Not everybody can be expensive. Not everybody exactly. can be top end free agents or or trades that you made. You you. I just all you have to do is you know quickly run through the 49ers or the Chiefs. There's there's guys who aren't making a ton of money who are making big contributions to the both. You're going to need guys, like you said, not big ticket guys. You're going to need guys to play above their billing. You know, you're going to need guys to play above their value. That's how 
you know, you know, that separates the good teams from the bad teams, man. You got everybody, you know, one band, one sound. Everyone's locked in on the goal, and you got guys playing out of their minds. Mm -hmm. um, the Eagles are going to need that tremendously in the 2024 season. They're going to need a lot of guys to play above um, where they were drafted and Absolutely. how much they make. Right, on both fronts. All right, good stuff there. All right, let's get a timeout. We'll talk a little bit about the Super Bowl, your excitement level. Did you watch any of the Pro Bowl stuff yesterday? A bunch of coaching moves uh, coming down fast and furious uh, around the league in terms of assistant coaches and coordinators and all those kind of things. At 1.30, Scott Lauber from the Inquirer will join us. We'll talk Phillies as yes. they are really close, really close. A little over a week away from pitchers and catchers reporting uh, for duty in Clearwater. Let's do all that when we get back. Don't go anywhere. Tone and Rob right now telling you about Flynn Tree Services. Yes, they're an experienced, licensed, and insured Pennsylvania tree services company that will trim or remove any unwanted trees off of your property. They offer cost-effective solutions to any tree problem that you will face. They, they work on all types of trees. So if you're having any kind of issues right now, I see a lot of my neighbors with, with a lot of branches down and trees down and all those kind of things. Uh, Flynn Tree Services is the place you want to reach out to. They serve southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey, and northern Delaware. You go to their Facebook or Instagram page for more information or a sampling of their work. Give Flynn Tree Services a call at 610-850-2848. 610-850-2848 or online at FlynnTreeServices.com. That's FlynnTreeServices.com. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Welcome back in, everybody. Sports Day. Tone and Rob hanging out with you on this Monday. 
All right, we're six days away, Tone. Six days from the Super Bowl. You had both teams, Kansas City and San Francisco, arriving yesterday uh, in Las Vegas. They touched down. Uh, they will have their media day today. They will go through a walkthrough. I already saw, ironically enough, it would have been more ironic if it was Kansas City, but uh, San Francisco didn't really love the condition of their practice field, and they are monitoring it very closely. So ah. they, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Welcome to the Super Bowl where you have other kinds of challenges you didn't see coming. They should start calling it the slippery bowl. Exactly, man. Exactly. Um, so I, I, I had a buddy, my, my friend yesterday said this to me and I didn't, I hadn't really thought about it much until he brought it up. So I, I want to bounce it off you in the chat. He said to me, you know, man, my excitement level really isn't there for the Super Bowl. So I started to think about it, you know, and, and, you have two big time teams in the 49ers and the Chiefs. Pretty evenly matched. I mean, Las Vegas has the 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 Niners as a two point favorite in the game. It's not like there's some underdog against some big Goliath or whatever. Right. You know, it should be a good game, but he he can't get up for it. And I thought to myself, all right, how much of that is Eagles fatigue, like Eagles beat down from what this season was? Cause he's an Eagles fan. He's, he's a, you know, Philly native um, versus just, I'm not really up for this matchup yet. Mm. Are you, where are you at with the excitement level for this game? As we're, we're under a week now. It's, 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 it's so funny when you brought this up to me, it, you know, my, my will started turning because I didn't really think about it too much either. And then the first thing I said to you was how much damage did the Philadelphia Eagles do to their own fan base with the past eight weeks? How much damage they really do to us as spectators, commentators, enthusiasts, however you want to label yourself. How much damage did they, did they do to the fan base? And like Rob said, live chat, we really want to get your perspective on this because um, I think it's important to figure out what's the temperature in the city of Philadelphia. What's the temperature amongst Eagles fans when it comes to this team? Because we endured a lot watching this team over the past eight weeks. Um, and time and time again, when we thought we knew them, they proved to us, they proved to be otherwise. Mm -hmm. You follow me, Rob? So yeah, yeah. Um, me personally, when it comes to the temperature of the Eagles and just this Super Bowl, I gotta be I I I, I think I'm with your I, I think I'm with your homie, man. I think I'm just not really up for the Super Bowl this year. Now, I'm going to a Super Bowl party. You know, my wife has a co-worker that invited us, and it happens to be her co-worker's birthday on the same day. So she's kind of having like a birthday slash Super Bowl thing. Okay. So we're going to go to that and, you know, indulge, and, and indulge in the festivities. But when I think about just my overall intrigue, it's really not there. Um, I'm going to watch it. It's going to be an exciting game. Don't get it twisted. And both of those teams deserve to be there. Do not get us, do not get us misconstrued, um, NFL fans. Um, this is not us being bitter. This is us just trying to be perceptive, perceptive to what's going on, um, you know, in our own backyard here. And right now, the grass ain't cut. Right now, we got ant hills all over the place. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's, it's just not the the vibes aren't right right now when it comes to the Philadelphia Eagles. And you know, I'm really curious to know uh, how much damage they did, how much, how much, how much damage they did to the city. Um, you know, where do you stand on that? I'm with you. Like, I, I think that I think in general, Philadelphia sports fans usually when their team gets eliminated, especially in difficult fashion they tend to sort of drift away. They just need to get away from it. Whereas I do think some other fan bases will, I'm not, I'm not necessarily like that. I'll, I'll keep watching the playoffs and, and whatever, but I think they're like that. But this season was tough tone. You think about it. I know they started off 10 and one, and it sounds crazy to say this season was tough, but it really was in the sense yeah. that, you know, they were sort of getting by with some things and then we went through almost, well, not even almost, about a two-month period. You're talking about about eight games where they flat out stunk, and it was like a slow-motion car crash. And I think that takes its toll. And then you go through a very brief offseason where both coordinators get fired. Like, there's a lot of things that have your head spinning right now. And you're thinking to yourself, my God, it was just a year ago the Eagles were in the Super Bowl, and we thought everything was fine. Had the coach. Had the quarterback. Had the players, had the GM, all those things. Okay, that, that you know, and, and maybe the other thing is last year's Super Bowl, people aren't even over that. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's all the above. But I do think Eagles fans have every right to be a little worn out right now and a little 
a little gun shy to read. Yeah. yeah. And also another thing that we got to keep in mind as well, this has kind of been um, gut punch after gut punch after gut punch for the city of Philadelphia over the past couple of years, losing the Super Bowl, um, you know, falling in the World Series and then losing in the game seven to an inferior team uh, in the NLCS. Uh, you know, the Joel Embiid injury, obviously. Um, Sixers obviously not being able to get the second round last year, losing to Boston the way they did. Um, uh, even the Philadelphia Union making it to the mountaintop and then losing to that was it the LA Galaxy? Um, uh, yes, yes. You know, um the Flyers going currently going through a rebuild, you know, and the whole Carter Hart stuff. It's just it's just been a really turbulent time to be a Philadelphia sports fan, um, for things on the field, things off the field. Uh, it. That's why you know Philadelphia Philadelphia fans. We're we're some of the most resilient fans in sports because we went through long trials and tribulations when it comes when it comes to our sports teams and we ride or die for them. And when things don't go right, man, food don't taste the same. The air we don't breathe it the same. Uh, you know the sun don't shine as bright. It's just it's it's just a heavy time. Whenever, um, especially the Philadelphia Eagles aren't doing what they're supposed to do. See, it, it'd be different if we if we could say to ourselves, you know what, you know we're just this this team is just flat out not good enough, and they weren't this year. But we looked at this team to to an extent and said, uh, they're better than this though. So it was just it was just too many issues going on with that Philadelphia Eagles team, and some of us ignored it. Some of us, you know, just kept saying to ourselves, whether ten and one or they're 8-0 or 7-0, we just kept trying to convince ourselves that, hey, this team is going to figure it out. Yeah. Lo and behold, they never did. And, um, you know, you know, we'll see how this thing goes going forward. But overall, for the Super Bowl, I'm definitely going to watch it. I'm definitely going to be into it um, come game day, most likely. But right now, Same. you know, of course you want your team to be there. But, you know, you got you know, you to sack up and say, hey, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I there's no question I'll be – you know, watching the Super Bowl, but I also, and, and I, I was one of those people who was saying to myself, well, the Eagles have a skill. They're still winning despite having their a game. And meanwhile, it was all about the crash and burn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, it, I think it's going to cause a little, I don't, I think Eagles fans are going to go into next year. Now the draft could change this and free agency could change this, but I think they're going to go into last year, a little gun shy too. Not that they're not going to be watching the Eagles paying attention or showing up or any of that, but I think there's going to be almost a little bit of Sixers sort of like, all right, I got to see it before I believe it. Sort of hesitation. Um, but yeah, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. All right. So uh, a couple other things. I, I didn't, as I said earlier, I didn't watch any of the Pro Bowl festivities yesterday. I, it just it just doesn't move the needle for me. At and all. I, I appreciate they're not trying to play the game and tackle out there and all that crap. They're trying different things. I just couldn't watch it. Yeah, it's, it, I, haven't, I haven't been into a Pro Bowl in years. Uh I look for, if anything, I look for, I, I look, I, I look more forward to like the off the field stuff where, you know, guys are walking around interacting with the people, you know, you know, the, the, uh, the camera stuff. There is just one, one clip that's floating around in the net that had me rolling. Um, Trevon Diggs' son. Uh, right. <laughs> he was, um, I guess he was with the, uh, you know, the AFC players and, um, you know, Stefan Diggs, that's Stefan Diggs, that's his uncle. So, um, he walks up to he walks up to Sauce Garner and says, "Hey, what's up, Sauce? Remind you, this kid is like tiny. It's like a this is like a, a a kid for real." He walks yeah. up, "Hey, what's up, Sauce?" Sauce is like, "Hey, what's up, little man?" He said, "Hey, man, I I got a problem with you." Oh, <laughs> and Sauce, Sauce like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> he said, "Yeah, man, you was talking all that trash, and then my uncle had to score on you, man, in week one. Yeah, remember that?" <laughs> oh <laughs> man, this, really? This is, a, this is a kid, like a small oh, kid. Boy. Oh boy. And Jalen Ramsey is cracking up. You know, uh, Ray Lewis is right there cracking up. It, it, it was just a wholesome moment, man. Um, so I was Gardner, uh, you know, handled like, you know, handled like a, like a real pro, like a real gentleman. I was like, hey, little man, like, you know, we, are we back on good terms now or what? You know, Trevor, Trevor, uh, Trevor Dixon was like, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Sauce was like, oh, so you, you like me sometimes, you don't like me all the time. He said, oh, I can roll with that. You know, I can roll with that. But it was it was just a, it was just a cool fun moment to see, man. Um, yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah, I, but I again, the Pro Bowl. I, I just love when I see all the top players get together. You see them just kind of humanized a little bit, just kind of yeah. being regular regular people. And uh, that was pretty. That's pretty cool to see. Pretty cool to uh, see. Uh, elsewhere, uh, the the saga, the soap opera of uh, Cliff Kingsbury ha <laughs> has come to a conclusion. We know where he's going to be now. So he will be the Commanders' offensive coordinator. If you remember last week, the initial reports were he was going to the Raiders. For whatever reason, that bogged down, whether it was money, whether it was control, whatever. Uh, 
So he now joins Dan Quinn's staff as the commander's coordinator. Now, here's what's interesting. They have yet to formally let Eric be enemy go because he still has time on his contract. Hmm. So I, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I don't know what it means for the enemy. I would assume that, you know, if I'm him, I don't want to be there any longer. Um, it, but there are very few jobs, if any, that are still open mm-hmm. for an OC. Man, what happens to him? I don't know, man. It just Eric Bannemi deserves an opportunity. It's just is it's really just that simple. I don't know how else I need to put it. Eric Bannemi is one of the better offensive minds in the league. He holds guys accountable, and that's the kind of guy you want in the building. Obviously, he has a history that the NFL clearly has not been in favor of. Um, but again, I don't think that's I think that's that's, that's BS, man. We 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 know guys in this league that have you know, former races, well, not former races, but guys who got racist emails getting job opportunities. And we got guys who abuse women and all this kind of stuff. Getting It's just all kinds of different stuff that we see around the league and the NFL pick and chooses who they want to ostracize. Um, and Eric Bannerby just happens to be on the wrong end of those things. And it's unfortunate because he's clearly one of the one of the greater minds in the league. Um, when it comes to Cliff Kingsbury, though, I love how you started out saying um, – the soap, he, the soap opera that is Cliff Kingsbury. And um, I told you I didn't like him because I feel like he's a shady character. He had the job in, in Oakland uh, with Las Vegas Raiders. All of a sudden, he leaves that and goes to Washington. Strange. Remember how I think he uh, – there's another situation where he had a job, I think, at USC, but then he left and became the head coach of the Cardinals. What, 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 is that how that happened? I can't remember Yeah, I exactly. think it was about to be either the OC – I'm trying to remember. I think it was he was going to be the OC at USC, and then he rolled on them. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, so it's, it's just yeah. it's just like he he's a shady character. Um, Just his yeah. name, man. He just seems like that – he seems like that that character in a, in a daytime soap opera that you just – you can't stand. Right. Cliff Kings, the Kingsberries. I don't know. It just <laughs> – oh. I, I, I know uh, it's it's very bizarre. Now here's the all the other part of this. So they they right now they have the number two pick, Washington. That's insane. They're so going to pick this, a quarterback. They're Jeff and a quarterback. It's about without question. They are. Here's the question. He coached at USC last year. Does he want to? Do they want Caleb Williams? Mm. Now Chicago could say you can want him all you want. We're we're taking him, but you know you could you could always move up a little bit too. Uh, do they take Caleb Williams or last year at North Carolina, they played a form of the air raid, uh, which is Cliff Kingsbury's offense. So does he feel like Drake May is a better fit for what he does? And by mm. the way, Sills, the, the all time, the all time great house was that house during draft <laughs> I night. can't I, stand I, it. I am, I'm not kidding. I am jealous as hell of whatever Cliff say, is rocking out. Say, same here. But I, 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 just, I just hate, you know what, so it wasn't the house oh. I hated. I, I hated right there. I hated just how he said, you know, real NFL guys, you know, they're in their office, they're in their war room. He said, you know what, I'm going to show off this whole. Yeah. This, this, this it was fantastic. a pretty badass move, though. It was, it was pretty bad. It, it, was, it was, it was, it was cocky. You know, it was, uh, it was, um, you know, it was cheeky. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, look, man, look, if I can't hate on the man, you had, you, you, if, if you got it, flaunt it. Right, but yeah. still, it, it just it just didn't it just gave me the wrong I, bottom, I, bottom. I don't know, man. It was just too cheeky for me. I got you. All right, so where 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 were we? I don't even know. Oh, do they grab Drake May or do they right Drake they May, Caleb Williams? Williams. Right, yeah. right, right. Oh, see, that's a good question because there's some there's some uh, people out there who like Drake May more than Caleb Williams, and the other way around. And um, this is going to be a very interesting draft with the quarterbacks because um, I'm personally not blown away with um the prospects but you know these teams are going to pull the trigger on a handful of these guys um wh- what you, who do you think if you had to roll the dice who do you think is going to have the better career Caleb Williams or Drake May because they're clearly the top two prospects Caleb if you Williams. had to roll the dice uh, Caleb, Caleb Williams yeah I, I like Drake May uh but I think Caleb Williams I I think that he the problem you had last year with with Caleb is he took he wasn't as good as his sophomore year um, there, he, he said some weird stuff after games, which I don't, I, I don't tr- try not to read too much into it, but I think he's a little eccentric, which could worry a little bit about the quarterback position. Um, but there's crazy talent there. He, his ability to make off schedule plays is better than anybody in the draft by a long stretch. 
Uh, he's got the arm. He's got the legs. I think he's a prototype NFL quarterback. I like him a lot. I would take mm. Caleb Williams personally. Mm. Mm. And Chicago, yeah. it's going to come down to, do you believe in Justin Fields? If you believe Right, in that's, that's Fields, what it's going to come down to, right. And those two guys are both going to fall into your lap, and you're going to have a decision to make if you're Washington. But my guess is, if you're asking me right now, I think I still take Caleb Williams. Uh, they would take Caleb, Caleb Williams over Drake May. Uh, that would be my guess. Yeah, you know, I don't, you know, I don't watch too much uh, college football. I don't really have the, uh, the time. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, from what I hear, you know, Caleb Williams, Drake May, you know, those guys are neck and neck for what I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, but again, we're going to set this thing pans out. Uh, this is this is going to really set the tone for that Josh Harris um, ownership group. It's going to set the tone, so they're going to want to they're going to want to make a splash. Um, if they got the opportunity to choose between Caleb Williams and Drake May, man, that's going to be really fascinating. Because see, it the pressure comes off if the giant. I'm not not the Giants. The pressure comes off Washington if um, Chicago drafts Caleb Williams or Drake May. The pressure comes off, right? But if you actually have the choice between the two, the wrong choice can haunt you forever. No doubt. Same thing. Remember how? Uh, who was it? Miami, they had the choice between drafting Herbert and Tua, and they chose Tua. Now, obviously, Tua is, is he's 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 figured it out now. But sure, I think when we look at Justin Herbert and Tua, we all we all say to ourselves, oh, I think Herbert is the better quarterback. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I think um, Washington, especially if they, again, if they had the opportunity to choose one or the other, they better choose right. I agree. I agree. All right, let's. Uh, so Luke Getzey gets the Raiders OC job. You know, for whatever it's worth, uh, Bill Belichick took out a a full page thank you um, in the Boston Globe to the Patriots fans, uh, which was classy. It's, it's a nice way to go out um, and praise them as the best fans there there are. You know, they always traveled well. They sat through bad weather, uh, helped us win. You know, the whole mm -hmm. thing. So he, he, yeah, he went out the right way uh, with the Patriots. Yeah, speaking of the Patriots, real quick, it's a new era in New England now. Completely. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious to see how that fan base acclimates to just the, this new wave of being normies now. Now they're normies. Now they're now now, now, now they're with everyone else. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> now they got to sit at the regular table with everybody else. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's well, I I, mean, I think they got a taste of it the last few years without Brady. Like, guess right. what? You don't have the goat anymore playing quarterback. This right. is what it feels like for a lot of us. Right, so but they, to... you still had Bill Belichick, so there was right. something you could probably hang your hat on, right? Yeah, now true. it's a complete new era. You know, they're they're regulars now. They're normies. Welcome to the regular table. Welcome to the breakfast club where the uh, the degenerates sit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very true. Very true. All right, uh, Le'Veon Bell. If you haven't heard that name in a while, he hasn't played in the league since 2021. Still only 32 years old, but he claims he's making a comeback. And there's only one team that he would play for. And in, in, in his in, in the post that he put out, he said, and you know who it is, which leading to the speculation that it would be the Steelers, where he had his most success. Here's the problem. He looked cooked at the end of tw at 21. Right. He sat out a couple of years now. He's 32 years old where running backs aren't appreciated to begin with. Right. Yeah. Good luck, man. I, I don't see it. Yeah, you got a better chance of coming back as a tight end. So, you know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> like, like the league already craps on running backs to begin with. You think you think a team is going to take a flyer on a running back who's been out of the league for two years, three years? Yeah, that was already looking cooked on the back end. Look, man, more power to you. Keep grinding. Do it. Do whatever you got to do to make it. You know, to appease yourself. But I don't. I don't really see um, how this thing ends well. Uh, I don't either. I, I think it ends with him not playing in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Flat out. <laughs> Most likely. Uh, Steve Belichick, Bill Belichick's son, will take over as the defensive coordinator at the University of Washington. He had worked on the defensive side for his dad the last 12 years. He gets the D.C. gig in uh, the college. Right? I think it, if you're him, you, you got to break away. You got to, you got to, you know, establish gotta go your, do own, your own thing. Yeah, you yeah. got to establish your own legacy, yeah. Yeah. And there's a younger one. I don't know, Brian Belichick, where he's going to end up, but he was working on the defensive side, too. This one is also one to keep your eye on with the Giants. Um, so they blocked Mike Kafka from interviewing for the offensive coordinator position with the Seahawks. Okay, because it's a lateral move, and they have every right to do that. But they still have been hired a defensive coordinator after Wink Martindale. And folks in New York are starting to get a little itchy. Like, what is going on here? There's been mass exodus from a lot of their – they fired their special teams coach 
Wink Martindale quit. Uh, you know, there, there's just been a lot going on there with that team. It feel, they feel very chaotic to me. Like yeah. it, 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 things aren't good. They like that one year was was just a, a freak accident. Like they're kind of dysfunctional. <laughs> A free gag to this point. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, the, the, they're, they're the little giants, right? They, they're they trying really hard, but they're just not a well-run team right now. And I've always been curious, when a, when a coach gets blocked, how does that how does that go over in the building after the fact? I've always wondered that. I, you know, I, look, I, this is where, I'll, uh, for once, I'll side with a team. I, I guess, like, if I really like Mike Kafka and he's calling the plays and he's my offensive coordinator, I, you know, I'm, guess what, man? We got you under contract. You're not going anywhere. Like, it's di- the only thing that's different is uh, with the situation we talked about last week. Bill Callahan wants to go coach with his son and coach the same position. He's an offensive line coach. It, what, I mean, go ahead. That's different. Uh, but in this case, I'm not letting them go either. I, and now you're right. There may be an offshoot. It's saying we're like pisses off other coaches in the building. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm saying Maybe. like, you know, if, if I'm Mike Kafka and I'm, I'm trying to further my career away from this organization that's going nowhere fast. Um, how does that go over with you? I mean, you're, you're, I mean, yes, you signed the contract. So evidently, you know, you, you have to let, you have to stand by that. And you know, it's, it's rules in place for a reason. The lateral move can to be job hopping, but um. I, yeah. Again, I've always been curious about how that goes over with you know between said coach who gets blocked and that organization. I've, I've always been curious about that because the last thing I want. See, I I was always taught you know if they want to leave, let them. And that goes in, in many ways in like relationships. Oh, I, I, I tend to agree with you. If usually if somebody wants to go, you're not getting the best out of them. Exactly. I don't want anybody disgruntled around me, especially when I'm trying to build something. So that's that, that's my mindset, right? I would agree with you. Um, but you know, clearly the, a lot of these organizations feel differently. That's that's why the rule is in place. Yeah, yeah. Uh so the Eagles have made it official uh regarding the Kellen Moore hire. Nick Sirianni put out a statement. It reads as follows: as an accomplished offensive coordinator, a former NFL player, and a Heisman finalist, Kellen has shown a tremendous ability to lead an offense at every level of the sport while gaining the trust and respect of his players and teammates. He is an incredibly smart football coach whose depth of knowledge of the game has helped him become a talented play caller in this league. During Kellen's tenure as an NFL coach, he has helped to develop some of the best quarterbacks in the league and directed some of the best offenses. We are thrilled to have Kellen join our team. End quote. All right. Exactly what you would expect. All right. right. I mean, Business as usual. At, at some point, regardless of all the hearsay and all the speculation and the um, the clickbait stuff, regardless, you got to be a professional. Yep. And although we all feel how we feel about the Nick Sirianni situation, we are got to be a professional and the chips will fall where they may. Hopefully, yep. um, everybody comes out on the right side of this. Hopefully. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I always, uh, mess up this guy's name. Iero Avero, who is, uh, he was kept on after the Frank Reich firing in Carolina uh, and he will be, he will remain the Panthers defensive coordinator under Dave Canales. So he will be staying. He is the rare case where a coordinator is held and he stays around virtually everybody. I see, I saw Lewis Riddick raving about him earlier. Everybody who talks about this guy says future head coach. So, you know, this is a situation where if you're the Panthers, you want a guy who knows what he's doing on that side of the ball. Smart move. Um, so uh, Evero stays there in Carolina as the DC. Yep, could agree more. Could agree um, more. Elsewhere, the uh, Greg Roman will be joining the Chargers staff. We don't know if it's going to be offensive coordinator, but he has worked actually with both Harbaugh brothers. But he worked with Jim Harbaugh in San Francisco. He worked with John Harbaugh in Baltimore, and it looks like he's going uh, to join that staff. We're we're, we're waiting to hear what uh, what role that he will have. Well, one thing we do know, his his Thanksgiving invitation will never get lost in the mail. <laughs> you know, John and Jim, they, they 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 clearly love him to death. Yep, taking care of him, taking care of him. Uh, all right, so uh, you know th- this is a this is where you feel for the athlete. So Patrick Mahomes' father, also Pat uh, Mahomes. Uh, was arrested for DUI, reportedly his third, uh, and his second one since 2018. Um, you know, I, I think Patrick Mahomes will be fine come Super Bowl Sunday. Um, but 
these are distractions that you don't need Super Bowl week, right? And if you're him, if you're Pat, you're like, that. come on, man. Like, we can afford a driver, dude. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll flip the bill. Like, what's going on here? So, anyway, tough deal. Tough deal for the, for the Sun. Yeah, yeah, we talked about this, right? You know, Pat Mahomes is kind of surrounded by a bunch of um, degenerates. You know, his uh, his brother, um, who was dealing with the sexual assault allegation, which somehow, some way, managed to disappear. Yeah, that's a, that's a different conversation. Yeah, um, obviously the dad with the DUIs, and he has a very eccentric wife. So, you know, the, we talked about this offline, right? You know, obviously, you know, Pat Mahomes is at the top of his game. He's at the top of his craft. He's on top of the world, and. Um, you know, when you have, you know, he has resources that can sort of, you know, mask, suppl- you know, mask or supplant these yeah. things that are going on. But it's going to come a point in time and every athlete goes through it. There comes a point in time where as you get deeper into your career, you know, as you get older, you know, as life is starting to slow down and your kids are getting older and you want to start trimming the fat out of your life. Yep. And, you know, people who become more liabilities than assets to you. You want to remove them. Yeah. You know, you're gonna always you're gonna always make sure they're good, but you're not gonna you you're not gonna ha- you're not gonna allow that person access to you but so much. Or maybe you just decide, you know what, I, I can't keep covering for you. So um yeah, man, it's it's, it's unfortunate, obviously. It's, I feel bad I feel bad for, for yeah. that. It's so. unfortunate and, and and if it's his dad getting this many DUIs, clearly he has some issues. Yeah. Um I hope that they can get them things sorted out, but right now. Pat yeah, Mahomes, and Chad, Pat I don't feel bad for the father. No, 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 no. In fact, no, no. It, he's a disgrace. I feel bad for the son. Is yeah, I point. don't feel bad for the dad at all because no. again, you're you're a liability at Correct. this point. You know what I mean? Um, yep. Yeah, it's so fortunate circumstance for the quarterback. You got to. He has a lot. He has who, a lot who, coming. Who, by the way, on right ne- now, there's never boo about this guy off the field, Patrick Mahomes. Never, never. never. So we don't hear anything, anything about him off the field. It's, it's yep. unfortunate. Again, you got you got a brother that's in uh, a jackass, and you got a dad. That's a why no. Exactly. Yep. It's a tough deal. Tough deal. All right. Let's hit it. Let's come back. We'll talk some Philly. Scott Lauber uh, from the Inquirer will join us as we are pitchers and catchers report February 13th. We are close. We are very close. All right. We'll do that when we come back. Don't go anywhere. Tony Shields, Rob Ellis, hang with you on this Monday. We'll be right back. I remember getting my heart broken when they lost the Super Bowl in 2004. We were big Eagles fans. We moved to South Philly because of the Eagles. When they won, we went straight to Broad Street and uh, everybody was going nuts over there. And it was just a, a memory that you'll never forget. Any professional sports coach will tell you there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Go passionately. Go fearlessly. Go confidently. Go first! Go confidently towards your goals with First Trust, Philly's hometown bank for nearly 90 years and the official bank of the Philadelphia Eagles. We're focused on getting you over the goal line. So go with conviction, go with trust, go first. and go forward with us by your side. First Trust Bank, the official bank of Philadelphia dreams. Oh, and go birds. 
Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. G-L-E-S Eagles We are back. Appreciate you hanging with us on this Monday. Tony Fields, Rob Ellis. All right, let's go to our next guest. I, I need my, my baseball fix, man. It, it has been too darn long. And joining us right now, excellent, excellent reporter who covers not only the Phillies, but Major League Baseball for the Philadelphia Inquirer. You can follow him on Twitter at Scott Lauber. Scott, what's going on? How we doing? Yes, how are we feeling, Mr. Lauber? Guys, how are you? I haven't seen you in a while. I yes. know. I know. Like we had to get you. I know you're gearing up. Uh, when do you when do you roll down to Clearwater, Scott? When does the move happen? Uh, I am traveling down there a week from tomorrow. Okay. Um, so on Valentine's Day Eve, which uh, makes my wife Ooh. very happy. I'm sure she's yeah. uh oh. <laughs> Got to make up for that one. She knows yeah. the life, Scott. She knows the life. Yes, uh, exactly. You, have, you know, this weekend you, you have your, you know, your couple's time. You do that kind of thing. Take her precisely. Out. Yep. Uh, exactly. Uh, so, a couple. I guess the first question I would have is: We inch this close to, to everything here. Um, you know, pretty uneventful, other than Nola, which happened early. Pretty quiet off season. Um, you know, running it back, whatever term you want to use. Do you sense that there's a last second move here in the making, Scott, or in the early stages of spring training? Or is this what you see is kind of what you get? Well, I think what you see is what you get. Um, you know, you never rule anything out, especially with Dave Dombrowski, who's been known to make big deals and make them late at times. But I think someone's market would have to absolutely fall apart. You know, Jordan Montgomery, for example, um, would have to absolutely have, you know, the bottom would have to fall out of his market and the Phillies would be, you know, maybe there. Uh, to sort of, um, you know, then swoop in. Uh, but, you know, a number of teams were probably in that bucket, right? I mean, he's a good player. Um, Cody Bellinger is a good player. I still expect those guys to get big money. I just don't know if it's going to happen before camps open next week. But um, I, I think what you see is what you get more or less. And I'm a little bit surprised. I'm a little bit surprised. I thought they had a bullpen move um, here and maybe they do. Um, a smaller move, but uh, a bullpen move kind of toward the end. I think there's a spot there for somebody, but really they've decided that, um, you know, what they had last year was a really good thing. They thought down the stretch. And I remember talking to some scouts the second half of the year and kind of posing the same question to a few of them, which was like, you know, when the Phillies were really rolling, I mean, in August and September, early September, sort of saying, is there a team in the national league who you'd trade their roster for right now? you know, roster for roster. And mm -hmm. the answer I got mostly was like, maybe the Braves, but I mean, the Phillies really looked good and they looked unstoppable right up until game three and four of the NLCS last year. So, you know, I think they look at this as an opportunity to, to bring everybody back. Once Nola resigned, uh, bring everybody back and take another shot at this thing. And it's not an indefensible strategy. I mean, I see where they're coming from and, um, you know, you can always get better, but, um, you know, I'm sure they'll remind us as well, um, and it's true that the beginning of spring training is not your last opportunity to improve your roster. So, um, you know, they could make moves during the spring. I, I don't think that there's a big move left in them right now, no. Scott, you, you briefly touched on the need maybe, or you anticipated maybe a bullpen move, right? Um, wh along with that, uh, what other moves do you think this team should or could potentially make? Um for example, we know they were they relied heavily on the home run, you know, to kind of get things going. And 
Um, not enough small ball play, but again, I don't want to I don't want to load it up for you. What other moves do you think they should make um, that they potentially could make? Well, that goes to that goes to what they decided to do, run it back, so to speak, um, because, look, they're in a situation where they've signed a lot of players these last three, four, five years that are multi-year contracts, big money, difficult contracts to move. Um, you know, I think we talked about it after the postseason that, yeah, I mean, if if you were to look at it, you were to say, like, how does this offense, um, this lineup uh, take on a bit of a different look? I think you'd have to move somebody out in order to move mm. somebody different in. And and that's not easily done. And I'm not sure who you move. I mean, do you move Nick Castellanos? Um, you know, there was some I know that there was some idle chatter about that early in the spring, but that's easier said than done. And he's also been a productive player. He was a productive player for them last year. So I don't know if you talk about um, mixing up the order a bit. I don't know if, you know, they've brought in a couple of new assistant hitting coaches. So I think that they're going to take a look, a uh, hard look at their chase rate, which went way up last year, why that was, and how they can bring that back down a little bit. You know, you're not going to suddenly stop Nick Castellanos and Trey Turner, for example, from from swinging at a lot of pitches, uh, including a lot that are out of the zone. But maybe, you know, a little bit of improvement goes a long way uh, on some of those guys. So I know that that's something that they've taken a look at in the offseason to try to address. And I'm sure that'll be a big topic in spring training. Like, how do they uh, become a little less dependent on the home run? How do they maybe make the offense a little bit more multidimensional? Um, how do they, uh, you know, utilize things like Turner's speed uh, in, a, in a more consistent way? Uh, we saw him run a lot more late in the season last year than he did early. I wonder if that's something they can look at. Do they mess with the order a little bit? Um, but, you know, I think that ultimately the pieces are there for them to have a top top three, top five offense in the National League again and score a ton of runs. It's just a matter of uh, making it more consistent, making it a little bit less uh, uh, feast or famine. Let mm. me ask you about the pitching, Scott, I, uh, particularly the starting pitching. Um, you know, you have Wheeler entering the last year of his deal. Nola, we know, is, is you know, redone. <clears throat> Suarez, and, and tell me if there you, you might see something different here, but Sanchez and Walker. Uh, it's, it's kind of the way I'm looking at this thing. I guess I'll start with Wheeler. Do you think they get something done with him before the season starts? I'm not saying before spring training, but before we actually get to the real stuff, do you think they get something done? And are you confident enough in that staff? Two part. Definitely not before spring training, but but I, I do think that they're going to talk in spring training kind of the way they did with Nola last year. One of the reasons why these extensions typically happen this time of year rather than earlier in the offseason is, there's a CBT, there's a luxury tax component to this too. So like if you, if you re, uh, if, if you extend Wheeler, you don't want that extension to go on your CBT this year. You want it to start in 2025. So okay. uh, those, that's why these sort of things tend to happen around, or, you know, in spring training, much, much closer to the start of the actual season, because if you get the deal done and you announce it at a certain point, it doesn't go on this year. It goes on next year. Got it. So I do think that they're going to make a real push to sign Wheeler, same as they did for Nola last year. I don't know if they're going to be successful. I mean, it takes two to tango. And I think what we saw with Nola last year, honestly, like I don't, I've never been able to find out exactly how far apart they were at the end of last spring, but obviously it was pretty far apart because they decided to call off those talks with like five days to go before the season. Mm -hmm. If they were close, they would have hammered something out uh, at the very end and gotten it done. Ultimately, you know, I think you saw a player in NOLA who was a year from a season away from free agency, who'd never been a free agent before. And maybe there was some curiosity there. You know, maybe there was some like, hey, look, you, you fight your whole career to get to free agency. Uh, you get that close. You might want to check it out. You might want to see what it's all about. And I think what he realized when he actually got out there on the market at the beginning of November was, I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want to play anywhere else. I don't want to, I don't want to change and pick up and go somewhere and start fresh. And so he was a free agent for all of, what, 14 days? It wasn't like he didn't get any offers. The Braves came after him pretty hard. I heard the Dodgers came after him pretty hard. Um, there were some other teams involved. It just came down to he didn't want to go anywhere, and the Phillies were willing to give him a deal that was uh, – uh, you know, uh, a, f a fair deal and a good deal and one that was um, it, not a discount at all. It was it was a fair market deal. So he was able to take it. Now, Wheeler is in a little bit of, of a different boat. He's a few years older than Nola. He's been a free agent before. I don't think he's got to scratch that itch. 
you know, to satisfy that curiosity of what free agency is all about. I don't think he's going to give them a discount. I think he's going to want fair value. And I think it might start with a three, you know, 30 million a year. It's not going to be a seven year deal at his age, but it could be a four or five year deal. And we'll sort of see how it goes. But I do think he's going to want to get paid like one of the top, top pitchers in the league as he has been performance wise over the last few years. It's not a stretch to say he might be the best free agent signing the Phillies have ever made. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not crazy to say that it's certainly, he's certainly in the top three or five, uh, so he's produced for them. He's going to want the value, but, you know, he does like it here. I can tell you that. He likes the pitching coach, Caleb Cotham. He's gotten very close with Nola. His wife, uh, her family's from New Jersey. That was a big part of him wanting to sign here in the first place and stay on the East Coast. So lots of reasons why he'd want to stay if the money's right. Mm-hmm. You know, Scott, you know, we briefly touched on what well, we touched on Zach Wheeler's uh, contract situation. And, um, just piggybacking off of it, I'm curious to know what's your perspective on the future of guys like JT Ramuto and um, Kyle Schwarber. You know, they're going to be free agents uh, in 2026, and both of those guys are north of 30. Um, how do you how do you anticipate the Philadelphia Phillies navigating those two guys who have been contributors for him? But, you know, obviously Schwarber, he can be feast or famine. Um, how do you anticipate them wor- working those things out as well? Again, those guys are north of 30. Right. And, yeah, I mean, they have some time. Right. Because those guys are up after. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm doing the math in my head right now after next next season. So, yeah, yeah, 2026, they'll be free agents. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, they have time. I mean, I think this is a conversation that we might be having a year from now. Like, what are they going to do for for real Muto? What are they going to do for Schwarber? Are they going to extend them? Um, Some of that will obviously have to do with the seasons that they have this year. I mean, I think real Muto in in particular, you mentioned the age and uh, the aging curve for catchers we know is pretty, pretty harsh, uh, or can be. So, um, you know, can he carry a, a, a workload of 120 games the way he normally does or North of 120 games again this year, if he does that and he looks like he's holding up well, then yeah, I mean, I think a year from now they might be talking about, um, uh, re-upping, you know, or extending him for example. So I think that there's time on that front though. Um, Wheeler obviously is a little bit more of a pressing thing cause he's going into his walk year. Um, but yeah, certainly those are guys who are part of their core, Real Muto in particular. And um, you know, I think if there's if there's a mutual interest at the end of the season, I think it could be something that they talk about. Scott, let me let me swing back, and that, that was my bad on the two parter. But uh, to the rotation, <clears throat> um, how badly do you think they need to upgrade that? Or are you comfortable, you know, going to battle with the with those five guys? So I think the front five. Um, look pretty good. You know, I think a lot of teams, um, I don't know that I'd say it's the envy of a lot of teams, but you know, there are a lot of teams out there looking for pitching and you can do worse, certainly a lot worse than the Phillies front five. It's beyond the front five that has me concerned. Uh, I worry about their depth in triple a, I worry about, um, you know, what happens if one or two guys go down now, obviously like if you lose Wheeler or Nola for any serious length of time, uh, it's going to hurt and it's going to be difficult to kind of figure that out and figure out how you pick up those innings. It's true of any team. When you talk about their top one or two starters, uh, if you lose those guys, it's going to hurt you, but it's, it's, it's the middle and back of that rotation. So like, let's say Taiwan Walker ends up missing time for some reason or, or, uh, or Ranger Suarez, you know, who typically misses a few weeks every year for some reason, whether it's uh, something to do with his arm or not. Like last year, he missed a couple of weeks because of a hamstring or a groin, I think it was. Um, you know, do you have the depth to kind of fill in for those guys on a short-term basis, on a on a slightly longer-term basis? I don't know that their answer to that is yes yet. I mean, we saw them go get Colby Allard last month. He was appealing to them for a number of reasons, one of which is that he has options. He can go to AAA and he can pitch down there and he can come up and down and he can be rotation depth if they need it. Uh, beyond that, you know, you've got Dylan Covey, whose spot on the team is is predicated on the fact that he you can stretch him out, but he has no options. He can't go to the minor leagues, and so he's kind of like your last guy in the bullpen. And if he had options, he'd probably be stashed in AAA starting all the time. Uh, Nick Nelson has options. He'll be in AAA. He's a starter now. Uh, Mick Abel, who is a prospect and the guy that they still really like a lot, but has one AAA appearance uh, in his career, is going to need more time in AAA. So what do you do if, like, in April or May, um, one of those middle-to-back rotation guys goes down? It's too early to make a, 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 
a uh, a real meaningful trade because teams are not don't trade early in the season typically. Um, do you have the depth to kind of get by? And that's my big question when it comes to their rotation. You know, Scott, you know, obviously baseball is that kind of sport where you have to kind of ride the wave, right? It's going to be the good stretches, the bad stretches. But, you know, with this Philadelphia Phillies team, they've been in the mix, you know, to win big for the past couple of years. World Series appearance the year before, NLCS lost, to, lost in the game seven. How open is this World Series window for the Philadelphia Phillies? And also, as a two-part question here, who do you believe – carries the most pressure in this organization right now, especially to live up to that World Series uh, top billing? Mm. Well, I'll answer the first part because, I, Tone, I think it's a great question. I, I think it's fair to discuss the window a little bit, the proverbial window, right. um, because they are running it back with the same team, which is, as I said, a defensible strategy, at least for this year. But if you fall short again, we're going to be discussing how much longer this group can stay together. It's not totally unlike and i know this is a completely different era but it's not totally unlike the late 70s when the phillies were getting to the nlcs every year and getting knocked out by the dodgers and if you talk to anyone from that 1980 team they will tell you that if they didn't win in 1980 they were expecting changes in 1981. Mm. Uh, ownership had made it clear we're going to take another shot at this thing and then if you come up short again we're going to have to change the mix now, I don't know if it's quite to that degree yet with this group, but, you know, I mean, you'd be looking at getting to game six of the World Series in 2022, getting to game seven of the NLCS in 2023, and if and they bring them all back again in 2024, if you don't win it, how long is the window? Uh, when do you have to start to shake up the, the, the group? When do you have to start to make some changes? You know, I don't think we're going to see another winter like this if they fall short again. Um, I think you're going to see some changes just for the fact that you can't run it back every time you fall short. You have to start to switch it up. So, you know, th they will make the argument um, that the window is not anywhere close to closing, that a lot of them are still in their prime, but a lot of them are now on the other end of 30, on the other side of 30. Um, uh, and while they, while you can expect good years to come from players like Bryce Harper and I think people like Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler – um, they are getting to that age where, uh, you know, they might start to peak and then we know it comes at the other end of the peak. So um, it's going to be important to continue to develop the, you know, Bryson Stott and Brandon Marsh and Alec Bohm and to get Mick Abel closer to the big leagues and to get um, some of their other prospects closer. We know Andrew Painter is a factor in 2025, but he's not going to pitch this year. So getting him healthy and rehabbed and ready for 2025 in order to keep that window propped as much as possible um, so that if you do fall short, you know, you've got young guys coming who can help fill in some of the gaps and maybe help change that mix. As far as the second part, you know, I don't know. I do think that there's probably a little bit more pressure on everybody, generally mm. speaking. I mean, you get to game seven of the NLCS as the defending pennant winner from the year before, and then you bring the whole group back again. I mean, if it's not like if the expectation is not to win the World Series, I mean, you know, I don't I don't know when else what the expectation yeah. would be right. would be any higher. So I think there's pressure on everybody. Um, you know, so I, I think that but I think with that comes motivation, too. I mean, Dave Dombrowski said something really interesting uh, pretty recently. He said, <clears throat> excuse me, he said once before in 2019, he ran it back with the same team with the Red Sox. Uh, he kind of regrets doing that because they went from winning the World Series in 2018 to, you know, winning 84 games and missing the playoffs in 2019. And he ended up losing his job over it. And he said, look, if I had to do it over again, I don't think I'd want to do that. I'd want to make some changes just to freshen things up a little bit. He doesn't think that this is a, an equivalent situation because mm -hmm. they didn't win it last year. And he feels like that's a motivator. Um you know, that guys are going to are, are still, I think, kind of like Rob Thompson didn't watch the World Series last year. And he was still talking about the NLCS, you know, well into the offseason. And like it was gnawing at him like that they couldn't come through and win that series and move on to the World Series and get another crack at it. So uh, I would expect most of the players were the same way that it kind of gnawed at them all offseason long. And that, you know, this is going to be an opportunity to kind of finish the job, so to speak, that they didn't get to do last year.
Scott, I really wanted them, and it could still happen, to get a, a contact righty, you know, Whit Merrifield type. Um, they haven't yet. It doesn't mean they won't. Um, how do you see center and left? Is this, you know, in some way, shape, or form, uh, you know, against righties, it's going to be Marsh, but is a lot of this on Rojas and Pache? Like, how, how do you see that with now that with Reese is gone, Schwarber's DH and Harper's at first? How do those positions look to you? I think that they're going to, uh, see what they've got in Marsh and Rojas, let them play. Um, and then if it needs to be addressed during the season, they'll address it then. But, you know, I do, I, I did sense a shift at a certain point in the off season where they kind of went from, um, you know, Rojas has to earn it. Rojas has to earn it to like, we don't want to block Rojas. You know, and I, I asked Dave Dombrowski back in December about that. I said, how do you thread that needle? Because you want to cover yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like if Rojas comes to spring training and, and just, you know, it doesn't hit. It looks like he looked in the postseason at the plate. Yeah, exactly. Like, then what do you do? Um, and, you know, I mean, they say, well, you know, we have Pache and we have other options and could always, you know, move Marsh back to center and put Jake Cave. And but like, let's mm -hmm. let's be real here. Like Pache and Cave strike you more as like fourth and fifth outfield types. Right. So, um, you know. I did think that they were going to bring somebody in, a veteran player, uh, maybe sort of a utility, super utility kind of guy like a Whit Merrifield, mm -hmm. who could, in theory, cover you if Rojas doesn't hit in spring training. And if he does and wins the job, that guy could be kind of like your 10th man. Mm -hmm. You know, he could play five days a week at five different positions. And they didn't go get that guy. And I guess they still could. But the indications I've gotten are that you know, if there was going to be a late addition, it would probably be on the pitching side more so than the hitting side. Uh, I've heard more than once, we don't want to block Rojas. We want to give Rojas every chance to win this job. So um, I think that, you know, the way it seems to be trending, at least to me, is, you know, let Marsh and Rojas play, see what happens for a few months. And if you need to, you know, they, they are probably your eight and nine hitter, right? So right. you could afford to maybe, you know, roll with them for a little while. And if it's not working, then you sort of shift gears mid-season and try to find somebody to help you out. There's going to be some outfielders out there on the market who are available, right-handed hitters who can maybe play center field. So, um, but I, I, I agree, Rob. Like I kind of thought maybe that was a move that they would make in the offseason just to give themselves some cover. Mm. What the reason, you know, the reason I say I think they're going to roll with them is that, you know, in not doing that, that's sort of the indication that they're giving out. Scott, so, final question for me, man. Um, again, appreciate the time you gave us today. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, Rob Thompson and how that last World Series was really gnawing at him. He didn't even watch it. Um, and also, again, a lot of pressure on his team coming into this season, um, knowing that, you know, this window right now, as they see it, is still open. Uh, what's the overall temperature with Rob Thompson and the players and the organization just right now, you know, going into spring training? You know, you know what's on their minds? Again, you've been around these guys. Um, what's the overall vibes, you know, in the bullpen and things like that in the dugout? Yeah, I was struck by, you know, so I saw him in, I saw Rob Thompson in December. I saw him again last month. And um, I was struck by just like, so you get to December most of the time if you don't win the whole thing. And it's kind of like that that disappointment of however your season ended, whether it was in the postseason or if you just fell short in the regular season and missed the playoffs, it's usually worn off by like the middle of winter. Like by the middle of winter, they're looking forward already and it was still kind of grinding on Rob Thompson. You know, mm -hmm. he's talked about how he's replayed a lot of um, a lot of the NLCS in his own mind. And I asked him at one point, like, well, what did you uh, what conclusions did you come to? And he said he kind of laughed and he said, I'm going to keep it to myself. You know, but I was sort of wondering, like, you know, do, do you do you replay it? Like, do you say, like, ah, oh, man, I should have gone and got that pitcher then or I should have, you know, hit for that guy then or, you know, um, you know. I, you know, I should have gotten like to me, like um, the one I always come back to is Kimbrell in game four, you know, um, after blowing game three. And like, do you, you know, and of course, I don't, you know, he's not going to um, he's not going to discuss it because he doesn't want to slam a guy or badmouth a guy or whatever. But like the fact that that was still like going, all of that was going through his head. And then even in January, you know, like he was talking about, oh, I can't wait to get down there. He, he, I think he got there on February 1st and he said, I can't wait to be around the guys and to kind of like get back into it again, because I really feel like we had something special last year. And 
you, you could really kind of feel the disappointment there that mm -hmm. like, I mean, they thought they were not only going to get to the world series, but win it with the way they were playing uh, the second half of the year. And, you know, I, I, I haven't spoken to as many players, um, um, but I'm looking forward to getting to talk to them uh, next week. And I expect that a lot of them kind of had a similar off season. Like mm -hmm. it's got to like be a, a horrible feeling when you've got that expectation and that confidence about yourself in October and you fall short and it ends as abruptly as it did, it's got to be a pretty empty feeling for most of the winter. And so I do think that, um, look, I've heard that a lot of guys are there already uh, working out on their own. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, I think February 13th is pitchers and catchers reporting date yep. and the 14th is the first workout. I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, three quarters or more of the team, the full team there wow. by then. Um, yep. So I do think that they're kind of that there's kind of this unfinished business aspect of it. And I think that's going to probably be a theme that we hear a lot this spring. And I don't know if it's I don't think it's just blowing smoke. I think that a lot of them felt that way, that that they were good enough to win it last year. It was taken from them by the Diamondbacks. And I think that they want to get right back to, you know, where they were and, and, and take their chances from there. Scott, great stuff, man. Thanks. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you throughout the season, but we really appreciate it. Have a safe trip down there. And uh, make sure you, you take care of your business this weekend. We don't want you in trouble. Yep. Yes, so, please. Here, Scott. And, uh, thanks I'll for coming. All right. All right. You guys. Thanks, guys. Scott. Right, Thank you, Scott. I appreciate man. it. Follow him at thanks. Scott Lauber on Twitter and, of course, inquire.com for his baseball coverage. All right, Tone. We took that uh, right up to the limit. We are out of time. Sure uh, did, man. Great show today. Great Monday. Yeah, good Monday. Good Monday. Uh, everybody, don't go anywhere because you have the National Football Show with Tone and Dan Cilio coming your way. Thanks to everybody streaming, everybody uh, listening, everybody in the chat. We will see you guys tomorrow, same time, same channel. Thanks.